here if you wanna if you wanna speak, put your thumb up or a wee tick or whatever suits. Um the meeting is able of oral evidence from the PSNA and the department on the issues to do with the porch. And then we'll have a closed session uh, from the bill clerk for the cl uh, climate change bill. Um, okay. The, okay. So can I ask uh, broadcasting please till places until uh, open session? We're in open now. Open session. Okay. Um, okay. We're in open session. Okay, members, um, you're very welcome to the weekly meeting of the Air Committee, and I hope you had a, as nice a break as possible during the course of Easter. Um, I want to advise members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament Buildings and online. You can use mobile devices as long as they're in plain mode and muted. And uh, keep yourselves muted during the course of the meeting unless when you go to speak. That means that they don't have interference in the background. In the background. With no apologies, and in terms of chairperson's business, uh, there's a meeting of the Office of Environmental Protection at 2.30 today, and we will be discussing this later on in more detail in the forward work program. I want to advise members also that I will be attending an informal meeting with the other uh, chairpersons of the committees with uh, and the chair of the NA Affairs Committee today at 12.30, and um, this may require me to leave the ERA Committee meeting and Philip can uh, cover whenever I'm away. Uh, I want to advise members that a working group has been established to develop the Assembly's Good Relations Action Plan. It is planning uh, to hold upcoming stakeholder events with marginalised groups, including those of BAME origin and representatives of other marginalised groups. In order to plan these events and ensure they're, they're, they are of value and meaningful for participants, and the work of the assembly committees are being asked to consider what information would be most useful to elicit from these groups. This may be in relation to service delivery, communication, and awareness of assembly work, access issues, uh, etc. Um, if you have any thoughts on this, you know, please forward them into Stella by the close of play today. Uh, Time of minutes. Uh, the draft minutes uh, of the twenty fifth of March are at page six. Can I seek agreement for those minutes? Okay, and uh, I'll sign them now on the next, next available opportunity, which will probably be next Monday or Tuesday. We're going back up in Parliament buildings again for the plenary. Uh, there are no matters arising. Okay, members, item four on the agenda is a PSNI oral evidence session, uh, the withdrawal of uh, DERA and local authority staff from porch. I want to refer members. Sorry, we have a wee technical problem at the minute. Can I just ask you to hold? Apparently, the cameras aren't working. So I'm yeah. just going. Um, liaise the broadcasting and see if we could just hold for three or four minutes we, we try and get the issue sorted. Will, will, will we go off, out of broadcasting, Stella? Will we go offline? I think we'll be live. We're just trying to get the, the, the camera. Okay. To see what's going on here. Oh, that's it. There, The cameras are now working. We're all going now, are we? Just go ahead. Yes, please. No problem. Okay, so, uh, so item five on the agenda here this morning is... Um, a uh, so, sorry, it's, it's an oral evidence session. Withdrawal of uh, dear local authority staff from the porch. There's a briefing paper from the PSNA at page fifteen, and I want to welcome by Starleaf uh, uh, Bobby Sim Singleton, the temporary assistant chief constable, community safety department. And I'd like to invite uh, ACC Singleton to brief the committee. Chair, sure, thank you. Um, obviously, members have received the written submission. I just wonder, are you content to add that to the record, or would you like me to read from it just to have it entered formally? Um, well, if you want to do, uh, would it be possible to do an overview of it or a synopsis of it? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best for you. Um, so, obviously, the Police Service of Northern Ireland has been involved in extensive engagement with their officials at both strategic and operational levels on matters pertaining to EU exit and the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. This engagement began in anticipation of the EU exit transition period, during transition and continues at the present time. The aim of, of this engagement is to provide reassurance and support in relation to DERA's functions at Northern Ireland's designated points of entry. The dissemination of regular threat assessment updates has also been an important part of this engagement. PS and I have also provided timely security and crime prevention advice to DERA and other partner agencies 
in support of their protocol functions and in the construction and adaptation of associated infrastructure. In terms of a timeline um, to cover recent events, on the 21st of January 2021, Assistant Chief Constable Mark McEwen, who was my predecessor, convened a partners meeting in relation to the emergence of graffiti in Lauren, which stated that all Border Post staff were targets. Operational activity was increased by PSNI at this time to be able to provide support and reassurance to the staff working in those locations. On the 1st of February 2021, Assistant Chief Constable McEwen issued a statement outlining the PSNI's position. And that statement said that the safety of staff working at points of entry is of the utmost importance to us. Where we have any credible information, we will share that with our partners and take appropriate action. We have, we have increased patrols at Lauren Port and other points of entry in order to reassure staff and the local community. ACC McEwen then chaired a partners meeting on the 2nd of February where he provided a verbal brief um, with regards to the PSNI's threat assessment in relation to staff working at border control points. An assurance was provided at this point to distribute this assessment in writing to participants and that was done on the 4th of February. On the 2nd of February 2021, in a media facility after the partner agencies meeting, which included DERA representatives, Assistant Chief Constable Mark McEwen said, Earlier today, I held a productive meeting with key partner agencies, including officials from DERA, local councils, the Department of Justice, the Northern Ireland Office, Border Force and Belfast Harbour Police. I am very concerned about signs of tension within the community in recent weeks. We've seen graffiti at various sites and other forms of intimidation on social media. Our investigations into these incidents are ongoing. In relation to an anonymous piece of information claiming paramilitary involvement and threats, I have briefed partners that we have no information to substantiate or corroborate these claims at this time. Keeping people safe is our priority and the safety of staff working at points of entry is of the utmost importance to us. We will continue to work closely with our partners to provide them and their staff with support. We have increased patrols at points of entry in order to reassure staff and the local community. As I said then, a written threat assessment was distributed to partner agencies, including DERA, by email on the 4th of February 2021 by PSNI. The threat, this threat assessment, which was produced on the 4th of February, has been the subject of regular review since. An update to this threat assessment was provided to partner agencies, including DERA, by email, firstly on the 8th of February, but then again on the 9th of February. And as I've said, um, really since that period, it has been the subject of regular review and updates have been provided there are partner agencies, either by email or verbally. Um, so, Chair, at this point, I would just like to say, in terms of the current position, um, the safety in, of staff working at these points of entry and control points um, remains of the utmost importance to PSNI. There is, again, as of today, no change to our assessment, um, and that assessment is that there is nothing to substantiate or corroborate any paramilitary involvement and threats of an, or intimidation of staff at points of entry or border control posts. As I've said, the threat assessment is and remains under uh, constant review. An update is provided weekly to our partners through the partnership meeting that we have, um, and there are still a number of reassurance measures which are in place. So we continue to retain officers in a dedicated EU exit team, which is based at PSNI headquarters. In addition, we have dedicated officers within neighbourhood policing teams across the country, um, co-located to these areas to ensure that we have people on the ground to be able to provide liaison and engagement with staff. We continue to provide security and crime prevention advice where required. Um, and as I say, um, whilst we do have concerns, of course, in particular with the recent tensions that have been seen, we maintain a watch and brief and continue to carry out that constant assessment to ensure that we're in the best place to be able to provide um, accurate information to our partners to ensure the safety and security of their staff. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Nathan. Um, bye bye. Um, okay, can, can I, I'm going to just have a number of members who want to ask some questions. Uh, the first on my list here is uh, Philip. Philip? Yep, thanks. Thank you, Chair, uh, th and thanks uh, to. Uh, ACC Singleton. Uh, I mean, I appreciate the the, the briefing. Uh, I, I, I'm a bit disappointed, though, that or maybe I'm not. Maybe the, I'm not disappointed at all. Maybe there was no interaction, but the, it says that the the PSNA convened a, a partners meeting on the 24th of January, which I assume included uh, dear officials and Mid East Antrim Council officials. Uh, but there, there's no, there's no 
detail of any contact uh, in your report between the 21st of January and the decision being taken on the 1st of February. So, I mean, I, I can only conclude that there, there was no uh, contact or, or, or wonder why it's not reported. So maybe if you could uh, outline, was there any contact uh, in that period and, and the nature of the contact? And then the other question, I mean, I'm just going to fire a couple of questions here. I mean, it's saying a meeting was convened on the 21st of February around the issue of graffiti. Was that convened by the PSNI or was that meeting asked for by uh, some of the partner agencies? Okay, um, thanks, for Just for clarity, so I think you, you mentioned the meeting on the 21st of February. It was the 21st of January, right. which, right. which was the day. Yeah. That, was, that was the day that the the graffiti that I'd mentioned had become known to PSNI. And it's my understanding that the partners meeting that took place then was called by PSNI effectively in order to discuss this issue. You mentioned specifically a disappointment that Mid East Antrim Council weren't involved in that partnership meeting on the 21st of January. At that point, up until that point, um, local councils had not been part of our partners meeting. And it wasn't until the 2nd of February when an exceptional meeting uh, was called of the partnership group that at that point local councils became members effectively of that group and they have remained since. So prior prior to the 2nd of February, local councils had not been part of that kind of strategic partnership group that we that we had set up and were running with DERA and other government partners. Okay, so I mean, I mean, what we're trying to uh, inquire about here at this committee is why a decision was taken to remove staff, primarily Department uh, of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs staff, but I mean that also has an impact on the National Council uh, withdrawing their staff. So from, from your report, the PSNA had a meeting on the 21st of January, informed DERA staff that the assessment was low. I mean, I, I've seen correspondence, we've been correspondence in the media this week, uh, between Department of uh, officials saying that the PSNA are saying the assessment was low. So there was no contact between the 21st of January and the 1st of February to say that that assessment had changed. Uh, you, any other information that was provided to you used uh, basically, you know, the anonymous threat used, used to smith that. I mean, we've seen uh, stuff in the papers this week that, you know, that, that may well have been fueled by drink. Uh, so from your point of view, from the 21st of January, you can write an assessment. That assessment didn't change. And yet it, it does seem strange that, that officials from councils and the department would seem to ignore your threat. I mean, do you have any knowledge as to why they would do that? that, that they didn't trust the PSMA, they didn't believe your assessment, or they thought they knew better than on security issues than the PSMA? Well, I guess ultimately those are questions that, that may be better directed to them rather than me, but certainly I haven't had any conversations with them specifically about this issue. You're right to say the PSNI's assessment did not change during this period, that being that these threats were unsubstantiated and uncorroborated. I, again, in terms of the individual decision-making that went on um, in other areas, Mini Standrum Council, those kind of places, again, those questions would have to be directed to the, the senior figures within those areas to, to account for. Okay, so the threat was low, it didn't change, there was no uh, organised loyalist paramilitary involvement, and I mean, there were some allegations made at Mid and East Antrim Council about uh, targeting of licence plates and other things like that. I mean, you, the PSNA have no knowledge of any of that taking place. And, no. Okay. No, that's correct. Fair enough. Well, thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, Patsy? Patsy? Patsy, you're on mute. You, you, you're on mute yourself. Yeah, okay. We're good to go now, I think. Um, and thanks very much, ACC Single, for, for attending today. I have just two very basic questions. Um, one is, we've heard evidence previously from um, NIPSA officials and, and the likes uh, about the risk or the potential risk uh, that was perceived at that time and how that was relayed on to the council. Now, what, what I'm trying to establish is um, any risk or any threat of that nature, can you advise me if at any point any complaint was made direct to police 
either by an individual or by a council or public body or DERA, that in fact there was a risk or a threat to be investigated by police. So I, I'm not aware of any specific complaint or concern having been raised in respect of an individual by any of those bodies due to PSNI during that period. Uh, beyond, I think, the reflection of kind of just general concern and apprehension from staff. And I think it's, it's fair to reflect that really from that period, from mid-January onwards, um, obviously with the kind of very visible display of heightened tension um, with graffiti and posters and such, I think that has led to a, a kind of a, a higher level of vigilance and concern. People have certainly been on edge. It's that sort of thing that has been reported to us rather than kind of specific uh, detail. Um, so, the only the only other issue during the period is, uh, and there's been I think some publicity regarding a member of border force who was the subject of um, anonymous anonymous information pertaining to some form of threat. But outside of that, no, I'm not aware of anything else. So there, uh, but you've answered that. There was uh, no point any uh, complaint or any case raised with PSNI regarding the threat to an individual or to the corporate body by either the individual or indeed any of the corporate bodies, the department or the pencil. No, not that's grand. Not. That's grand. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I needed to know. Thank you, Patrick. Um, jo John, are you able to come in? Yeah, I'm here, Chair, and thank you. Um, if it um, suddenly logs me out at any point, you, you will understand the reasons. As indicated, there's some connection problems here. Um, straight to questions. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank uh, our ACC Singleton for his presentation. Congratulate him on his appointment, my first opportunity to do so publicly, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be further opportunities. Uh, the thing I'm trying to clarify is we, we were given a briefing previously about, about a, a sequence of events around the... Um, 31st of January to the 1st of February in conversations between the Minister and, and DERA, which is obviously our specific interest here. And the, the Minister at one point, as is publicly recorded, saying that he didn't believe the police um, fully understood the level of threat. And I think the word in word PS and I had full understanding of the threats. Um, can I ask for clarification? Were, were, were police updated immediately prior to the uh, minister's decision on the 1st of February to withdraw staff and um, at the same time by Mid and East Antrim Borough Council when they took a, a similar decision. And we're, we're, the, the question is really, were, were police updated <clears throat> given the relevance of that to, to threat assessments? Um, and th that they should have been informed of actions taken by both the department on that occasion and the council also. Joe, my apologies. I, I lost you temporarily during that. I couldn't ask you just to repeat that. <clears throat> yeah, sure. And you're hearing me now. Okay, are you? Okay. The question is really, well, we have been told um, previously, and it's a matter of public record, that the, the minister informed the department secretary on the 1st of February uh, prior to his withdrawal of staff from the ports, that um, his 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 assessment was that police he was not convinced PSNI had a full understanding of the threats. That's been reported to this committee. So what I'm keen to establish here is what information was given to police on the first of February, either by the department or the minister uh, directly, or by Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, who were taking a similar decision around the same time. Given the relevance of their actions to any assessment being done of the level of threat, I'm keen to know if police were informed and how they were informed and how often they were informed. Uh, but John, what I can say is my understanding is that the Permanent Secretary reflected the Minister's assessment and concerns regarding the PSMI's assessment, if that makes sense. Uh, but beyond that, in terms of providing any kind of richer detail around that, there was no information forthcoming that I'm aware of beyond simply to say that um, there was a concern that the PSMI did not fully understand the threat. Okay, and to be slightly more specific, was any attempt made um, either by the Department Stroke Minister or by the Council at that point to have a <clears throat> urgent reassessment of the threat prior to the action they took? Was any reconsideration um, of the level of, of threat assessment sought by either the council or the department before they took that action? Not that I'm aware of. Um, 
Now, in the subsequent meeting that took place on the 2nd, there was a request, I believe, for PSNI to revisit the threat assessment, which, of course, we had we then provided a verbal update to that meeting and then subsequently followed it up again in writing, restating that the position had not changed following the verbal update. Uh, but outside of that, no, not that I'm aware of. Okay. John might have just been uh, lost uh, contact there. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, okay. I'm going to move around to Claire here. Claire, Claire, uh, sorry, William. William. William, can you hear? William? Or uh, Morris? Can you any use here? Or we're having technical difficulties here this morning, but right. There's something. Can you type in as I'll get hold of broadcasting? I can, I can hear, uh, Chair. Okay, we've got Morris, and then we'll come back to William. So, well, Morris. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and thank you very much uh, to, for, for taking the time out of duty to, to come here this morning to give us this presentation. Uh, I have only really one question, and it, and it surrounds the movement of a Larn port worker for his own safety. Uh, I'm reading it from the Belfast Telegraph. It said the worker and his family were moved to secure housing in recent weeks amid rising tensions due to Northern Ireland Protocol. As, uh, and it goes on to allude that this move took place during the time that uh, sinister graffiti had appeared all over Northern Ireland. Uh, again, the, the newspaper report highlights the fact that the, 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 the worker contacted the PSNA who found it to be a credible threat. And as far as the newspaper is concerned, and if you can believe newspapers, uh, sometimes I wonder, both the Home Secretary and uh, the Secretary of State were informed of this development. Did any Larne Port worker contact the PSNA in regards to a threat? And was any Larne Port office, officer moved because of such a threat? Thanks, Morris. And um, it's the the long stated position of PSNI that we don't actually comment on threats against named individuals. Um, but in terms of that article, what I can say is that um, no no member of staff who works at Lauren Port has been the subject of any threat. So there are I think there are a number of issues with that particular press article which are potentially misleading. I can say that much uh, yeah. without. Without unfortunately going into any further detail, because as I say, we don't comment on threats to individuals. That's fair, fair enough, thank you, Chair. Uh, and it, it uh, highlights the problem that we in Northern Ireland have to endure through social media, the media, and newspaper outlets who, who seem to delight in sending out false information or information that's not correct, uh, not accurate, accurate, I should, should say. Listen, thank you very much, uh, Assistant Chief Constable, for that answer. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Uh, we'll go back to William. Okay, we'll see. We've got I you. Muted, muted on one, yeah. No, I hear you. Okay. Yeah. We'll All right, okay. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to thank the Deputy Chief Counsel for reading so far. Uh, I, I just didn't hear the. Uh, I, I was cut off, so I didn't hear the previous speaker's que question in total. Um, can I ask, was there anyone moved onto the SPED scheme? This has been clearly circulated that there's someone, who, now, irrespective of who it was, I have no idea, but was there a member of staff from Leavenport moved onto the SPED scheme? Are you aware of that or not? Hi, William. Yeah, I just mentioned that whilst we can't comment on individual threats, um, and I, I guess this can also be related back to the overall assessment, so I think. Um, it had been suggested that the Belfast Telegraph had described, a th um, or had certainly reported that there had been a credible threat. You know, our assessment would still be that there is no evidence of any uh, corroboration or substantiation for paramilitary involvement in any threats up until this point. Um, and it, with regards to Lauren Port, no member of staff from Lauren Port has been the subject of a threat or indeed a sped move. 
None. Okay. In relation to, was there any information came to you via crime stoppers in relation to threats? Um, well, again, without being drawn on individual incidents, which we don't comment upon, we do on occasion receive information from Crime Stoppers, the independent charity. And again, one of the, the challenges with Crime Stoppers information is that uh, certainly when it arrives, it is in its own right often uncorroborated and unsubstantiated. So one of the first things we will look to do is for is to try and establish whether there is any information that can potentially corroborate or substantiate that. That's part of the process that we go through. But of course, police encourages people to contact right? crime stoppers if there's any suspicion of any threat or danger in every world of life in Northern Ireland, isn't that right? Yeah, we do. Well, actually, in the first instance, we'd encourage people to talk to us about it, to come and have a conversation with their local neighbourhood officer or to call us on 101 999 in an emergency. But we recognise that sometimes, um, through fears for their personal safety, people don't feel comfortable doing that. And in that respect, crime stoppers offers you know a great channel in terms of providing a means through which people can provide information anonymously um uh, via that service so, so, so i think of what you're saying there may have been some information in via that route is that right and uh, well certainly you know throughout this period there's been information received both through local police officers but also through the likes of crime stoppers and other medium and you know everybody will have seen um, the escalation in tensions from around mid-January onwards and I guess to use an expression we very much had a rear to the ground in terms of trying to understand the sentiment within communities and to be able to kind of bring that all in and synthesize it in order to arrive at our threat assessment which is a set at the start of the committee remains unchanged that there is no um, substance or corroboration to indicate at this point that loyalist paramilitaries have been involved in the targeting of port stuff. Is what level of risk do you think is acceptable? Well, um, as I said at the start of the meeting, the, the safety and security of um, well everybody, but in this particular instance, um, staff working at the port is a priority for us. Um, in terms of those levels, ultimately it's up to different departments and agencies to carry out the risk assessment based on the threat assessment that we provide to them, and it'll be up to them to determine um, against that particular threat, what the proportion of response is to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, William. Okay, uh, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, Claire. Thanks. Um, and thanks to ICC Singleton for your time this morning. I want to go back. I know it's, it mentioned a lot of the, uh, media reports there, but there was um, a recent media report that has purported to have seen papers from officials at the department and they are saying that this, this supposed threat has um that has come so i want to ask you first then so around that time around the first of february when this was all happening and staff were being removed had the ps and i received any direct threats regarding staff and not asking for detail of the the threats but was there any direct communications that threatened staff that were received by the psni um, so i think there had been um an anonymous call to the sunday world around the 27th of january which i think coincided with the northern ireland select affairs committee um so at that point there had been this anonymous call to the Sunday world, so I think that was possibly the only information we had at that point. But in terms of a, like a direct referral from any of the agencies, no. No, and no direct communications with yourselves that a threat from an individual? No. No. There was a recent report then, um, I think it was on the back of an FOI, where then departmental officials are said about this threat, um, that it was received following the discovery of threatening graffiti opposing the REC border checks, but was claimed that the threats may have been fueled by alcohol. So are you aware of, did anybody report this threat to you or the PSNI aware of um, a drunk person making any sorts of threats? No, I'm not, I'm not aware of that specifically. I don't know if the officials were referring to the, the call to the Sunday world or not. I'm, I'm not privy to that. Okay, um, and the, or what it was that they were specifically referring to. 
Okay. Uh, so the call that happened to the Sunday World of the Sunday Life, sorry, um, you, you don't know the detail of that threat? No, or that uh, no, no. It, I'll, tr I'll try and get the detail of that, but I don't have it to hand at the moment. Okay. Um, so outside of that one, um, is that the only direct verbal threat that the PS and I are aware of having taken place? Well, again, I, I, I don't know that it would describe that as a direct verbal threat because, again, it came through a newspaper, but in terms of potential threats, there have been a small number. Um, so there's that one and then the one that was alluded to in terms of the border force personnel, uh, the second issue. Okay. Um, so, so nobody in the department um, reported any drunken calls or further threats directly to the PSNI then? No, not that I'm aware of, sir. Okay, and anything from the Minister or Mittany Stantrum Council who reported any threats to the PSNI that they'd received or were aware of? No, not not the people working at Border Post, no. Okay, grand. So, listen, just want to echo the sentiments then expressed by Morris there as well, that when, when he was said about, you know, warning about misinformation spreading via the media and social media in particular. Um, and this is exactly why we need to be reliant on the expertise and assessment professionalism from the PSNI um, on these matters. So thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Um, William, are you looking back in again there? William, you need to unmute. Will you just uh, unmute yourself there? No, I'm okay, thanks. Okay. Oh, sorry. I was looking at the the WhatsApp for somebody here. I, I, I was I was behind myself there momentarily. So, um, okay, members, um, I want to thank ACC Singleton for his attendance here this morning and for taking all the uh, the, the questions and answering answering all the questions. And um, so, I want to wish you a good day, ACC Singleton. And uh, can I seek agreement from the committee members to publish the PSNA briefing paper on the committee's webpage? Okay. Right. Thank you, um, ACC Singleton. Okay, members, um, we're going to move on now to item number six on the agenda, and that's oral evidence from on the withdrawal of uh, DERA and local authority staff from the courts. I want to refer members to the briefing paper uh, from DERA at page 18 of your packs. And I want to welcome by Starleaf, uh, Dennis McMahon, the Deer Permanent Secretary, uh, Robert Huey, the Head of Veterinary Service, Norman Fulton, Head of Food and Farming Group, and Mark Livingston, the Director of Operation Readiness, uh, Food Supply Security. I want to invite officials uh, at this juncture to brief the committee. Declan, sorry, um, just two seconds. We have got Robert Huey and Mark Livingston and Norman Fulton, sorry, isn't mm -hmm. coming today. So if you okay. just maybe um, wait for five minutes, um, you'll, you'll just remain in open session. So just be aware that it's been broadcast and we try and get the uh, remaining two witnesses in. So we just take a pause for a few moments.
Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello. Good morning. Thanos. Apologies, you caught us a bit by surprise. Um, uh, you, you finished a wee bit earlier than we were expecting. Apologies for that. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if uh, if is is um, Robert on yet. No, Robert's not in yet. Uh, Mr. McMahon, Dennis, so, um, right. uh, Mark, Winston's in. We're just waiting on Robert Huey to come in. Okay, so I'll just make sure that Robert, uh, if you just give me one second, I'll make sure that he's he's uh, in for, uh, he's on. That's uh, Robert uh, Huey is in now. All the witnesses are here now. Declan, if you want to make a, a, a restart there, please. Okay. Members hear me okay? Yeah. Right. Uh, I want to welcome you here this morning, Dennis, Robert, Norman, and Mark. And I'd like uh, to invite you to uh, brief the committee. Um, Dennis, uh, you're, you need to unmute yourself or something because we can't hear you. Still can't hear you. There's something wrong. Stella, in a moment of panic, can I just check? You can hear me. This is Robert here. I can hear Robert. Yes. That's um, okay. Just, just I see the boss panic, and so I'm going to panic too. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm just getting from broadcasting. Um, I think he may, I think he may try to put a headset in. So maybe it's the laptop volume. If you want to try the volume on the laptop or the PC that he's using, Dennis. Um, broadcasting or sound, maybe try your volume, Dennis. I don't know whether you can hear me or not. Try turning your volume up. He has, I don't know. Um, Dennis, the only thing I can suggest is that you go out and come back in again. Maybe that'll help. No, it's still not working. Um, Is there is there an aspect of this brief that we could pick up up with on with Robert until Dennis resolves the technical difficulty? Is that possible? Well, 
Robert, can you hear? Would you be able to step in until we get Dennis back in? Yes, I, I'm content to answer questions until Dennis joins us. Scary though that proposal is, but thanks for that, Declan. <laughs> 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 um, Robert, well, I'll over to you then, Robert. Okay. Um, um, well, R R Robert, uh, do you want to uh, uh, maybe you take a couple of questions in before then before the Dennis would get the to do the briefing? Is that what you prefer? Well, I, th I think um, uh, Dennis's brief. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been, uh, been delivered with that, but it it lays out a chronology of, yes. of what happened. Some of which you've heard before, and some yeah. which is some which is new. Um, but I think I can I can probably dip into that and uh, answer some questions. If not, yeah. I'll tell you so. <laughs> do the best. Well, Robert, I suppose I might ask you a question again, come from the veterinary perspective about um, you know what 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 has been. The impact uh, on this of this decision, um, and or or the potential impact of this decision, you know, uh, in terms of our, our veterinary controls and for the um, implementation of of the protocol, which was obviously which to facilitate, you know, smooth east west trade. Now this is the later decision of Minister Puts uh, to halt the um, further recruitment of staff. Into the port facility. That's the decision you're talking about here, Dad. Right. Just to be clear. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The staffing of of DERA veterinary service in general has been very difficult over the last uh, period. Uh, and just to illustrate that, uh, we had a recruitment um, uh, for veterinary inspectors into the department uh, competition, and it's likely that there'll only be three to five come off that competition. So the marketplace uh, for veterinarians is difficult um, uh, before any decision to halt moving further staff in, into the port uh, temporarily. So, so there and there are other issues around um, uh, civil service rules uh, that make uh, it difficult. You remember famously, I said to you one time that uh, the way in which I was going to staff the port was to rob Peter to pay Paul by moving um, veterinary staff from the field into the port. Uh, but because the the staff in the port are working on shift pattern, and those on, on in the field are working plain time, I can't actually compel or force, not that I'd want to anyway, vets to go to work in in the port because I'm changing their terms and conditions. So, so that makes um, staffing the port difficult from just a day-to-day -day point of, point of view, uh, and uh, so it, it's not one single fact that makes staffing the ports difficult. It's a cumulative facts, and and that's just another one. Um, and to be to be honest as well, it's not attractive work. Um, it's enforcement work. It's frontline work, uh, and there, you know, and and and. To many vets, it's not attractive, so it's not something that people are lining up to volunteer to do. Um, and that's before then you have the added uh, personal security issues, um, uh, which we're talking, which we're going to talk about today. So the, the minister's decision to halt is a factor, but it's only one factor amongst many. Can I can I just check, Chair? Can you hear me now? Yes, we got you, Dennis. I'm really sorry about that. It's just a, a little uh, confluence of uh, problems, technical problems, and uh, we were we were you finished a little bit earlier in the previous session than we expected. Oh, we're we we're, we're having a very detailed briefing from Robert there. He covered uh, he covered you well, Dennis, whenever you were tapped right off, uh, off, off offline there. So I heard him saying that I should be worried about that, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll just more than that. Um, um, would, you, yeah. would you like me to say a few words to start? Or yes, Dennis, do you want to more or less we'll, we'll, we'll reset here again if you want to commence the briefing then? Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Chair. Um, so thank you, Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to come before you today to provide further evidence on the decision taken by DARA to temporarily suspend physical inspections of products of animal origin at Belfast and Larne ports. With the agreement of committee members, I'll restate some of the key points just to set the context for further questions, although I won't labour them, and to briefly bring you up to date on the current position with respect to SPS operational delivery programme. So I'll just update you on the timeline. So, as I said before, DERA takes health and safety very seriously. Since March 2018, health and safety has been an item on the agenda of over 100 top management team meetings and formal updates. 
have been provided to the departmental board on 16 occasions. So this is a regular focus for us. Our focus has been on ensuring that the capacity, policies, equipment and support is in place to protect staff and the people who use our services. And we do this in line with our legal duty under the Health and Safety at Work Act to look after the well-being of our staff and uh, the people working alongside them in DERA facilities. We're also informed by the Human Rights Act and in particular the right to life. Um, and importantly, however, our interest goes well beyond the legal requirements and into um, the need to, to look out for our people's well-being, given the range of operational roles that they take on board. So with your agreement, it's probably worth going over briefly again. I know you've touched on some of them again, the key elements leading up to the, to the decision on the 1st of February. Um, but it's just helpful in terms of elaborating um, the further developments. So Thursday, 21st January, their officials alerted to incidents of graffiti, as you've heard. Thursday, 28th of January, the issue of security discussed at a meeting of Solace, and uh, the Chief Veterinary Officer was at that. Sunday, 31st of January, as I know you've already mentioned, uh, Minister Poots called me to express his concern about the safety of staff at points of entry, and he stated that a local government officer had contacted him to alert him to potential health and safety risks as a result of threats to staff at Larne. He also referred to conversations with political colleagues at a range of locations across Northern Ireland and other stakeholders who reported uh, threats. He subsequently contacted the PSNI and I, uh, to, to provide more details. At our morning Gold Command meeting on the Monday, the 1st of February, and that's part of our major emergency response plan. And again, that's important for understanding how we approach these things. Um, at, at that meeting, departmental officials confirmed that they've been in touch with PSNI as part of more regular engagement on the issue of the ports. A follow-up meeting was held with officials to discuss the situation. Monday 1st of February, uh, Minister Poots called me again at midday. He stated that he was formally registering his concerns about the health, safety and security of Dara staff working at portal points of entry. Following this conversation, I spoke to uh, ACC Mark McEwen, uh, senior PSNI officer. He confirmed that the PSNI was gathering additional intelligence through local police and that he was bringing together a stakeholders meeting for the next day, which I agreed to attend. Um, he, agreed, he agreed to share a formal written threat assessment following that meeting the next day, although at that stage his assessment had not changed significantly from the previous week. And I'm always wary about, for the reasons that were talked about, that uh, of not sharing the detail of those threat assessments. But there was, there was um, Mr McEwen did actually report um, his position um, in the media on the 2nd of February, and that pretty much was the position which was around uh, considerable tension within the community the incident of graffiti, social media commentary and other low level incidents are indicators of that community tension, which raises concern. And uh, also, but also saying that uh, he did not believe that paramilitary at that stage involvement or uh, since to my knowledge uh, was behind the threats. Um, so uh, then basically uh, that led up to, uh, as, as I said, I spoke to, to um, Mark McEwen, Monday the 1st of February at the request of Solace, uh, Minister Poots met with the chief executives of Mid and East Antrim and Belfast councils. At that meeting, concerns were highlighted relating to threatening graffiti, reports of vehicle registrations having been recorded, feedback from councillors and young staff in particular feeling threatened. And I should also say at this point, Mid and East Antrim had uh, separately written and copied us into a letter that they had issued to the Cabinet Office outlining their concerns on the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, including the health and safety of staff. Monday 1st of February, Minister Poots called me during the evening saying that he wanted DARA staff to be stood down at Lauren and Belfast ports given the risks identified. He stated that, as, as has already been noted, he was very concerned about the risk posed to staff. He was not convinced that the PSNI had a full understanding of the risks based on the feedback he'd been receiving. He emphasised the duty of care that officials have for their staff and noted that Mid and East Antrim Council were already taking action because at that stage they were. They had uh, they'd indicated that they were um, removing people from the ports. So following the phone call with Minister Poots, uh, Robert and I spoke, uh, Chief Veterinary Officer and I spoke to agree a way forward. I, I contacted Robert. Um, some key considerations were lack of knowledge of any formal written threat assessment from the PSNI. Uh, new information had been provided by Mid and East Antrim Council about uh, staff health and safety. And the council had taken a decision to remove staff from potential danger while allowing time for an updated formal threat assessment. Uh, see the fact that staff at both Belfast and Lyon had expressed serious concerns about the potential threats that they perceived. And D, that the department would require, in addition to a formal threat assessment, a risk assessment and mitigations addressing the DARA specific concerns. 
On the basis of those considerations, Chief Veterinary Officer and I agreed to measure precautionary approach. Um, and uh, this involved on the basis of, this led to a statement on the basis of information received today and pending further discussions with the PSI, DERA has decided that in the interest of the well-being of staff to temporarily suspend physical inspections of ports, uh, products of animal origin at Larne and Belfast. Uh, the situation will be kept under review and in the meantime, full documentary checks will be carried out as usual. Um, and that's actually important too, because we didn't actually remove staff from the ports. We, we, uh, we stopped the physical checks and I think on those particular products. So it's just an important point of clarification. During a subsequent telephone call, I confirmed with Minister Poots that he was content with this wording. He said, he stated that he was. Minister Poots temporarily resigned from the post at midnight on the 1st of February 2021 and was replaced by Minister Gordon Lyons. Minister Poots resumed his ministerial office on the 8th of March. So the further timeline is, following on from the evidence provided um, previously, 2nd of February, PSNI meet, stakeholder meeting held, uh, attended by myself, Chief Veterinary Officer and other DARA officials. It was agreed that a formal written threat assessment would be forwarded to the organisations involved in the meeting. The organisations would then use this to set the context for their own risk assessments. Uh, there was correspondence between myself and uh, ACC Mark McEwen, securing agreement on a note to go to Minister Lyons to Executive Collins. This was subsequently provided to Minister Lyons as, uh, as a verbal update by Minister Lyons to, to the Executive as a verbal update on the 4th of February 2021. 3rd of February, uh, DARA officials produced a draft DARA risk assessment. Senior officials met to discuss prior to receipt of the formal PSNI written threat assessment. Uh, Minister Lyons was briefed on the timeline and background to events. Minister Lyons indicated that he would wish to make a decision before the next steps. Correspondence with ACC McEwen on the PSNI threat assessment, asking for it to be shared with DARA formally, following up on uh, previous conversations. Uh, Chief Veterinary Officer attended a PSNI stakeholder meeting. Senior DARA officials met to discuss the DARA risk assessment prior to receipt of the formal PSNI written threat assessment. 4th of February 2021, PSNI written threat assessment received by DARA. Minister Lyons gave a verbal update to executive colleagues. Senior veterinary officer, officer uh, attended the PSNI stakeholder meeting, and then senior DARA officials met to discuss the updated risk assessment and the formal written PSNI threat assessment. Specific risk assessments were produced for each point of entry and mitigations were quickly implemented to mitigate identified risks. A PSNI stakeholder meeting happened. Uh, myself and senior officials, if you remember, briefed you on that day in the error committee. And mid me staff from Council Chief Executive had indicated to me that a decision was due to be taken on the return of Council staff at Lyon Port. So 5th of February, their officials met with representatives of local councils. Uh, Minister Lyons was uh, briefed on the next steps to be taken by the Chief Veterinary Officer. Um, correspondence with ACC Mark McEwen, thanking PSNI for their support. And I'd like to put on record my thanks to PSNI for their support throughout this process and for their, their, their help and agreeing to take up uh, their offer of crime prevention assistance, which was very welcome and very, very well received, I have to say, and I attended some of that myself. Um, senior veterinary official attended the PSNI stakeholder meeting. Chief veterinary officer visited Belfast and Lauren Ports. 8th of February, Minister Lyons responded to Permanent Secretary's submission of 5th of February 2021, confirming that he would not be involved in health and safety decisions. 9th of February 2021, letter issued from Permanent Secretary to ACC Mark McEwen requesting that any change in the PSNI threat assessment is communicated to DARA. PSNI stakeholder meeting attended by senior veterinary official. 17th of February, letter from permanent secretary to ACC Mark McEwen seeking weekly email to confirm no change in the PSNI threat assessment. 22nd of February 2021, correspondence with Mid East Antrim Chief Executive about the erection of an opaque, opaque scheme around uh, screen, sorry, around the staff, staff car park at Larne Port. 23rd February, email from Mid East Antrim Chief Executive confirming contact points for further operational issues and mentioning graffiti in Carrick. 24th February 2021, update from PSNI confirming no change to threat assessment. 5th of March, update from PSNI, no change. Uh, 11th of March, update from PSNI confirming no change to threat assessment. 9th of March, update. Uh, 20th of March, uh, some renewed security, local security issues at Don Crew. Uh, which we, we resolved subsequently. And, and as part of that, on the 21st of March, there was some correspondence from the Chief Veterinary Officer on secure, those security issues. 
31st of March, update from PSNI confirming no change to threat assessment. 7th of April, senior official attended PSNI meeting. 14th of April, PSNI threat assessment received and no change. And 14th of April, senior official attended PSNI meeting. Um, I was going to say, Chair, with, with your agreement, I could give you one minute just to update you on where we are with the SPS operational facilities, or we can take uh, questions now. Um, but it was a few few things I just thought might be helpful to update you on um, that they're they're not um, directly relevant to the inquiry, but they are relevant to understanding where we are with the ports. Okay. Can you on that? That's helpful. Uh, if members are okay, we can we can. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, then. So um, I thought it just would be helpful with your agreement to add a little briefing about the current position in terms of SPS arrangements. So there had temporarily rescheduled planned activities in relation to the permanent facilities and ports. We've been reviewing the scale of the permanent facilities in light of the initial data from the live running of the program, recalling that we had been working to a ridiculous time scale about this to deliver this. And um, we had to rebase our program. So I advised you that at the last time we spoke that um, the permanent facility will be completed before the end of March 2022. Um, it's now clear that we're, we're going to need to seek executive approval from the Northern Ireland Executive before any build of permanent facilities could commence. Prior to this and over the coming months, we'll need to prepare a full business case before seeking approval from the Department of Finance and HM Treasury. But in order to prepare a robust business case, we'll need clarity on the demand for services the impact on staffing and the appropriate scale and design of any uh, permanent infrastructure to support the, the delivery of those services. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. There are, however, some very significant unknowns which still need to be resolved. And the primary concern relates to the potentially huge increase in volume if we reach the end of the current implementation period and do not have the necessary mitigations in place. So one of these is the Digital Assurance Scheme or, or DAS, DAS, which uh, Defra is leading on, and they've been doing some excellent work on this, but it's still at very early stages of the design, and we have some significant questions to what can be you know, delivered and when. So Defra's aim is to create a digitally enabled end-to-end -end solution for suppliers, traders, retailers, and hauliers to efficiently manage trade. Our current analysis is that the, common, the number of common health entry documents will increase from approximately 2,400, actually, sorry, it's about 2,700. We're doing 2,400 checks per week um, at around about at changes uh, to at least 10,000 a week. Uh, there's huge variation and uncertainty in these figures, but you know that's where that's where part of what we're trying to deal with. Um, so we do know that the, an increase in certification will have a very significant impact on businesses and customers. And I suppose all of this makes it difficult, if not impossible, to complete a full business case in line with managing public money, Northern Ireland, BOF, and HM, Her Majesty's Treasury guidance. Given this uncertainty and the scale of the works, we're not, being, we're not expecting to be in a position to put final options to the Northern Ireland Executive ahead of the 1st of October 2021. While we've already completed the procurement, our current estimates is that the construction would take more than a year, and we do not expect, therefore, permanent facilities to be in place subject to Northern Ireland Executive approval before 2023. In the meantime, the Minister has put a paper to the Northern Ireland Executive colleagues and is uh, continuing to seek and wait for an executive discussion to be tabled. With regard to staffing, the Minister's position is that there should be no recruitment at the ports for the purposes of SPS checks, and we're looking at these options in relation to this, and we'll be happy to discuss further as, as appropriate, if that's uh, when you wish. In the meantime, I thought it might just be a helpful bit of additional background as to where we are on the programme, and i um, happy to take any questions you have. So, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan, there's a couple of things I want to just mention before we... Um, um, go around the rise of members looking at the questions. Um, just following on from the briefing from the ACC uh, just before yourself there, and we, we have learned from the uh, the PSNI that the 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 threats were unsubstantiated and uncooperated. Uh, um, they're not aware of any complaint that was made to the PSNI. Um, despite this, the minister believed that the PSNI didn't have a full understanding on all this here of, of the threats. And um, he, he was liaised with political colleagues and the mid east National Council. And what you're saying, quite rightly, the department takes it very seriously. Well, that being the case, uh, taking the threats seriously and the health and safety very seriously, you know, wh wh why, why then, if that's the position of the department, 
did did the staff continue at the ports then? If if that was the case, it looks to me more that that, that this is more to do with the, the the checks as opposed to you no. Know, if the department were were deadly serious uh, about uh, threats to staff, wh- wh- why then did they just why did they continue? Uh, you know, wh- wh- why was it the, the why did why was the focus go on to the checks as opposed to the staffs in this what you made with what the minister certainly deemed as uh, a danger zone or or uh, an area that uh, uh, you know uh, a risk to their health and safety. I think that you've, you've raised some really important questions in that, um, and I would put points in that question. Most, um, I'll, I'll deal with the first one, which is really about the principle of this, because there's been quite a lot of interchange between the use of the word threat, individual threat, and um, risk. And I think those are different things, and different different organisations have different responsibilities in that. And I know the, in the previous evidence, which was really helpful, there was some some highlight of that about the fact that, for example, departments deal with risk. Our responsibility under the 1978 Health and Safety Act to take that responsibility seriously and to work with it. Um, and you know, whereas the threat assessment is a general threat assessment, it's typically not location specific. Although more recently, the police has actually um, you know said that their threat assessment relates to the specific issues around the ports. The threat assessment that we're receiving, and I suppose that's because there's a there's a changing threat, a, situ- uh, a changing situation in, in the wider community. Um, so they they focus their attention on the court and the, on the ports for now. Um, the key thing, I suppose, is that the police give the, the threat assessment, the general threat assessment. We then use that for our risk assessment, and th- there's a really important point here about health and safety. And that we had we we've had good communications with the police. We've always had good communications with the police. I think the the correspondence that I've just outlined, for example, is just part of that, and the meetings that we've attended. But we've we've always had that relationship. And I, again, I would thank them for that. Um, the the but what we're required to do is we're required to take decisions that are reasonably practical, and we're required to evidence that, because if something happens to somebody down the line. Uh, say if there was a corporate manslaughter issue or if there was a lesser health and safety issue. More generally, I'm not just talking about in this particular case, I'm talking about health and safety more generally. We are required to be able to show the evidence that we, we what do we take our decisions? How do we take our decisions? What do we base our evidence on? And how do we ensure that the that staff were safe? And this, this is not a symmetric thing. It's not like, you know, well, it's not like um, if somebody, if the police were to say to us, there's an immediate threat to your staff, we'd act on that immediately. There'd be no question about that. If there's a question about a broader level of concern in the community, and there, there are significant questions about what we need to do about it, you know, there are broader questions being raised, which just lead to a concern about safety, then we, we have to act as far as is reasonably practicable on that. And that's what we've done. And that takes us into a bit that Robert might want to comment on. We we took a decision, and Robert, this was very much Robert's um, stare on this, which was about actually what is the what is a measured response in this case, and the the issue um, in terms of staff going out to do the physical checks is that they're outside, they're visible, they feel vulnerable, and particularly when there's this level of concern um, going on. We were concerned that we didn't want them to feel like that. So maybe if you don't mind, Chair, Robert might comment a wee bit more on the thinking behind that. Yeah, because, um, Chair, you do need to get into the detail of this to understand uh, how I I came to this conclusion about a measured precautionary approach. So the checks carried out in the port, as you know by now, there's three parts. of them. The documentary check are done by uh, admin staff remotely uh, from the port. So there is no risk to them. So there's no reason for stopping documentary checks. The identity checks are largely done through seal checks in GB. So there was no need to to stop those. The, the, the threat was not against those staff. So that can bring you down to the physical checks uh, and and what we should do and what we shouldn't. And the risk, uh, and this was all, all, all done with knowledge of, of, of where the staff feel vulnerable. And staff feel vulnerable when they're up at the back of the boat pulling the lorries off the back of the boat, um, where, they're, where they're exposed in their yellow jackets and visible for all to see. So what we did was what, that we we stopped doing what are the vast majority of the checks, which are the uh, the, the product checks, uh, and we suspended those for a period. Uh, 
and that allowed the staff not to have to go to that area because the animals and plants largely come to us without any any other direction uh, and that seemed to me and at the level of evidence that we had on a monday night after 10 o'clock in a place where we had no written threat assessment from the psni uh, where we had an elected forum that had already made a decision at that time on the monday night uh, to withdraw their staff um, it seemed precaution uh, it seemed measured precautionary approach to do what we did and that's where we came to uh, that's how i came to that conclusion so it's it was a compromise uh, but it was one which i have to emphasize the staff were happy with um, because otherwise we wouldn't we wouldn't have went there and i made it clear to the managers uh, directly on the floor that nobody, no one was asked to do anything they weren't comfortable doing. And that's where we left it, for our management on the ground to ensure that no one was asked to do anything that they weren't comfortable with. And, and I, I think, and we'll st I'll stand over that decision, I think it was the right one at that time. Um, well, uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Robert and Dennis. Um, I'm going to move uh, around the room here. The um, number of members have asked some questions, uh, want to ask questions. Uh, Philip? Thanks, Chair. Uh, and thanks, uh, Robert and Dennis. Uh, some of this stuff we will obviously have previously covered. I have a number of questions. Uh, I'm just going to dive straight in. Dennis, I mean, Dennis, are you. Did you express. Did you have any concerns or express any concerns to the Minister that. There was the potential that he was making a political decision or exaggerating uh, another issue or exaggerating the safety of staff to make a political decision based on his political viewpoint about the protocol. No, I didn't make I, I didn't make that uh, point. Obviously, there was a discussion about the nature of the threats and um, you know and the fact I was clear about the fact that I wouldn't make a decision without you know, without evidence. Um, but on the other hand, um, that, that works both ways. At this stage, if you remember, we still didn't have the written assessment. Um, we'd had conversations, really useful conversations with the PSNA. Um, and, the, you know, the, the, they've been consistent with what they've said all along. At that stage, there was no evidence of any paramilitary involvement more generally. Um, and, uh, but, you know, in their view, that was their view. And uh, but that there was social tensions, and I mean, that, I suppose that's that's always the piece behind this. It's not just so much that uh, you know, it, it's not just the organised involvement. It's the fact that once tensions are higher, things can happen, and they can get out of control very quickly, and we know that. Um, so the minister was was pushed the pushed, pushed the position very hard. Uh, I thought he was genuine. I thought he he was expressing genuine concerns. Um, you know, as I said previously, um, I was talking to the minister. The minister is a politician, so obviously the minister will have political views and political input. But um, I, I got the impression that he was genuinely concerned and felt that we weren't aware of all the risks and that we weren't uh, taking them seriously enough. My my view was uh, we'll, we'll act, but we'll only act on the basis of evidence. Um, but that, as I say, that's not... You know, the evidence is, is needs to come from all angles. Well, I mean, there's a difference between, and that's a key point about evidence. Then is because there's a difference between allegations or assessments than there is uh, when it comes to evidence. And I mean, you, you mentioned the department have a duty of care over staff. I mean, surely any reasonable person would, uh, because they've said it, and, and we all understand it. Acknowledge that the PSNA have a duty of care over every citizen uh, and individual in terms of threat to life, to their property, etc. So, I mean, you, you you pointed out that you know you, uh, if questioned, you would have to provide evidence. Well, I mean, surely if the department were questioned, if something went wrong, and they were able to point to the fact that the PSNA were saying that there was a low risk. That, that that would be go so, a long way to ensuring that the par department had uh, followed procedures uh, properly. I mean, th there's the other issue of the timing of this. That I mean, the PSNA said from the 21st of January the risk was low. So even though others were saying 
you know, this has happened, this has happened. The PSNI assessment was always that the risk was low. On the day of the decision, the PSNI decision, assessment was the risk was low. There was a meeting organised for the following day when some of these other issues that that people had could have been put directly to the PSNA and the PSNA would have had an opportunity to either say that is not true, we have no intelligence of that, we have no assessment of that. So, you know, the fact that that extra day wasn't given for a full picture to be shown, uh, many people will question the political nature of this decision. I mean, there's also the issue of Midden East Antrim's involvement, and you, you very helpfully uh, said that Midden East Antrim wrote to the British Home Office concerned about the implementation of the NI protocol. So, I mean, from that, we, we, we can certainly gather where their political uh, attention and interest lay. Uh, government office, just to uh, I don't think that's going to diminish my point, <laughs> but thank you for clearing the accuracy. Uh, and I mean, we now know from meeting with the trade unions that you know the stuff. And this is why I, I say evidence is key. You know, Mid East Antrim made a, made a public commentary at a meeting when they made a decision that we now know not to be true. You know, they they they, they said that the trade unions had concerns. Trade unions met with us. They said that that they were. Uh, they didn't have concerns uh, over and above what they had said. So they were misinterpreted at the council meeting. Mid and East Antrim made uh, uh, public pronouncements about uh, intelligence gathering, number plates being taken, which the PSNA have refuted. Uh, so, I mean, th- my point is there was a decision made by a DUP minister the day before he was gone, which created chaos in a matter of around the, the NI protocol that, that he was politically against, based solely on uh, evidence from officials or councillors or political uh, political partners who had the same assessment, not on any evidence and not on the assessment of the PSNI. And a day before, there was a scheduled meeting with the PSNI when all of this could have been sorted out. Uh, so from that point of view, I mean, are you saying you had no concerns given all of that, that this was a political decision rather than a decision based on the safety of staff? Um, my my position on this is very clear. It's it's about, this is, let, let's just take this back to, to the basic principles here. We have to take decisions on the basis of the legislation. We have to be able to evidence those, position, those uh, decisions now, um, the, just it's helpful, uh, while I don't want to, st- I think one of the things about that, and this actually, this conversation really is a good example of that, is that it's great having conversations, it's great having regular meetings, but actually you do need some, sometimes you need things in writing to be able to take decisions that you can stand over. And the, at the point that we were talking, at the point you're, where your, your question's focused on, we still didn't have a written threat assessment. I think it's also important to say that you, you quite correctly said the police, and by the way, the police have gone above and beyond the call of duty in terms of helping us. Certainly since since all of this happened, we've, we've had some great support, but we always had great support from them. But they are not responsible, cannot be held responsible for the health and safety of our staff. That's just, I, there, there cannot be a risk, a threat assessment um, you know, that comes from the police that, that um, would, would, would cause us to bring staff back in, for example, if we were worried about a particular issue. That, that, has to be, that has to be our decision. We have to take into account the threat assessment. And I suppose the key thing here is it's the nature of the, the police assessment. So the, the, on the 2nd of February, as I said, uh, ACC McEwen was quoted as saying, considerable tension within the community. The incidents of graffiti, social media commentary, and low-level incidents are indicators of community tension, so that does cause us concern. Um, and but, but the point being that at that stage there was there was no evidence of, um, according to the police, of paramilitary involvement. Now, if the police were saying to us tomorrow, if the police were saying to us tomorrow, there's an immediate threat and you need to do something, I can assure you we would act on that immediately. That would not even be a question. But I think what we're talking about here is a slightly more nuanced assessment. 
it's an assessment that is saying, you know, there are tensions. We don't believe that paramilitaries are behind those tensions. Um, or uh, Organized paramilitaries, I should say, is an important caveat there. But we do believe that there are tensions. Um, so for us to take a decision, that, that's not a, you know, there's absolutely no uh, risk of anything happening or any problem ever. Now you take that, and as Robert has, has uh, reiterated the point, we take that, you take the fact that Mid-East Antrim, as far as we could see, were acting on the basis of uh, that they, they were concerned. Uh, as far as I could hear, the minister was genuinely acting on the basis of concern. Um, and, and, you know, um, we had a good discussion about that. We had a good, you know, uh, exchange of views. Um, so all of those things uh, being equal, without, without so much as a piece of paper to support an action, that, because remember, there's not there's two decisions here. There's a decision to keep people doing what they're doing, or there's a decision to stop. So there's no such thing as no decision in this case. If we had said we're going to ignore all that, we're going to uh, we're we're going to um, you know act without a written uh, threat assessment, and and for that matter, a, a risk assessment of our own to base that on. We're going to ignore the concerns that staff have raised with us, and we're not going to act on any of that that would have been a decision. So for us to, to, to for, for me, this was, this was the, there's, a, there's a balanced decision. And when there's a balance, as, as Robert says, we have no problem about, about saying when there's a balance or a question mark, we must act on the basis in line with the legislation, but actually just in line with doing what's right. We must on, act on the basis of safety first when it comes to staff. So that, that's, I'm, I'm being honest with you, that's the that's the information we had at that stage. That's how we acted on it, and that's why we acted on it. Okay, and one final point, Chair, with your indulgence. I mean, so the PSNA, I'm going to keep repeating this, the PSNA made an assessment, they made it publicly uh, the week before. Uh, there had been ongoing contact. On the day of the decision, there was contact between the department and the PSNA. They stated that their decision hadn't changed. The risk was low. There was a meeting set up the other day, which could have been, could have explored all of this information. So the minister took a decision, not against PSN advice, but ignoring PSN advice, but based on advice from Midden East Antrim Council. On that basis, can I ask who the minister spoke to in Midden East Antrim Council? What were the specific threats that were detailed? And given that you know we're talking about written uh, and evidence being key here, is there a readout of the calls between the minister and Midden East Antrim? Um, there, I don't have a read out of the calls, um, but the the main um, the main note which you already have is the uh, and the, there's a minute of it as well um, was if, if, if the committee wishes to ask for it. Um, there was a meeting on with um, at the request of Solace, as I say, which had the chief executive of Midden East Antrim and the chief executive of Belfast City Council. Uh, there um, and that was on the uh, that was on the first of February, I believe. So I'm just having a look at my notes again. Um, so yeah, that was that was, that was earlier that day, Robert. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So uh, so that so that 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 is the readout of the of that and the concerns that were raised by Mid East Antrim Council are recorded in the evidence I've given to you, and also in the. Uh, you know, and, and there was a, a separate minute of that meeting. Yeah, and and the, you, you didn't feel prior to making the decision, or the minister didn't feel prior to making the decision that it would be prudent to wait less than 24 hours to meet with the PSNI to discuss all of this? Well, I think I think there's two decisions you're, you're talking about here. There's the minister's decision, which really did escalate this issue, and he did escalate this issue through myself and through the officials. Um, and actually, um, so that that's one decision. So he he clearly felt. I mean, I just just want to address the political point as well, to be honest, because one of the things about working, and it's one of the things we find more generally, one of the things, one of the major uh, um, uh, benefits of the system we have is we get a lot of political feedback from the ground, um, through the ground, you know, through through political representatives, and that happens through the assembly, through this and other means. So you know, when I get an assessment, a political assessment for, you know, there's something going on on the ground. It's not, it's not unique. 
to find a situation where we may have a view as officials that something's working very well, for example, in DERA, and then politicians may come to us and say, you're not aware of X, Y, or Z. I mean, I'm sure you've done that yourselves. And when that happens, I always take it seriously um, because um, it usually turns out to be right. So that's that's the, that's that's that was so, so that's that's why that's the basis. So in terms of our decision, we used we we took that uh, we took that information into account in that way. So that's, okay, thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, John. John. Thank you, Chair, and can I thank Dennis and uh, Robert for the. <clears throat> additional specifics that they've put on uh, some of this today. Um, and uh, as well as that, say that we, we on the committee are, of course, are very aware of the seriousness of any threat or perceived threat to, to staff. And, and we, we understand fully the responsibility of those with the duty of care towards those staff. But nevertheless, because of the sequence of events, this inquiry is absolutely necessary. And um, hopefully I'll hi highlight the necessity of that in, in these two questions. Can I have a clarified, um, please, Chair, uh, to, to Dennis? Um, there's mention of Solus, the local government representative body, on the 28th of January and also on the 1st of February. Um, did officials attend the meeting on the 1st of February that the uh, minister had with Solus? Uh, yes. They did? Yes. Okay. We were, we, were, we were invited to it myself and Robert attended. I can't remember which one of those, but there were other officials there, uh, ministers, PS, and so on. Okay. And uh, on the same theme of the, the involvement of officials, um, the timeline that I have um, referred, and this is repeated in, in the presentation and, and documentation provided today, but was given to us as well on the, on the 4th of February. Um, can I uh, to just clarify that there's a Mention in, in the timeline of um, the minister speaking to a local government officer on the 31st of January that the minister had contacted police and talked to colleagues. Um, the minister had relayed the concerns to, to the permanent secretary 1st of February, a conversation with Solis 1st of February. Um, in the contact between the minister and the local government officer, for example, on the 31st of January, how much um, involvement was there from DERA officials in those conversations? No. Very, very no. Officials from the Mid and East Standard Borough Council. And, and between the 20th, let's say the 28th of January Solis meeting and the decision um, or recommendation of the 1st of February, how many conversations took place between DERA officials and Mid and East Standard Borough Council officials? Well, oh, there have been. I, I don't have. I don't have a record of that just on me, but I know that there were some conversations because um, we have. I mentioned the Gold Command meeting that we have, and I believe that these issues were raised. And Robert might be able to give a bit more on that, but I'm certain uh, we could certainly look into the records as well around that. But I know that Robert will have passed back some concerns that had been raised at the Solus meeting through Gold Command, and uh, I don't know. I don't know whether. There was anything on the i think that was probably um on the friday the thursday or the friday so robert you might want to just clarify that point now subsequently when the when the minister uh spoke to uh the official on the saturday or when the official spoke to the minister on the saturday and raised these concerns um then um we we had no involvement in that conversation um i was subsequently contacted by the minister the next day who told me that he had uh he had talked to um the uh, official, uh, the official had spoken to him and raised these concerns. He also talked about the fact he talked to a number of politicians um, about concerns that they had, um, and it was widespread, it was beyond the immediate sort of vicinity of the courts. Um, and he had, he said, uh, which again I welcomed, and I, that's why I didn't really want to go over his his evidence with him because I thought quite correctly the right place to do to to, to make sure that uh, these issues are raised is with the PSNI and the minister did speak to a senior PSNI officer on the um, on that evening on the Sunday the 31st of January. Okay, so thanks for that. So, so we're clear that on the conversations on the 31st of January that the minister had with officials, there were no officials from his own department involved? No, not, not to my knowledge. Anyway, certainly I wasn't 
Robert, but um, I'm, I'm fairly certain he can tell me if that's wrong, but uh, um, I, I'm not aware of any officials. I just, and it was never even a question for me because I, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, there's no, the, the issue I suppose, I was treating it sort of in line with, um, you know, the way you would treat a whistleblowing case. So that's, that was the, that was the thinking around that. Okay, f f thanks for that. Uh, second question uh, relates to the, the, the policing situation in contact with them. And I should probably declare at this point that I, I'm a member myself of the Northern Ireland Policing Board. Um, and I'm glad to hear of, of the positive feedback on, on police engagement, of course. But so that I'm clear, between the um, decision taking on the 1st of February and all that took place in the build up to that decision, can I clarify if the department at any point made any attempt for urgent contact with the police for an update before that decision to withdraw staff was taken? Um, I think we've been in regular contact, particularly since the graffiti. Um, and again, this might be something Robert could comment on, but um, the main the main piece, I think there's an important point here. There's a, there's a sort of, um, the, the question has been asked a couple of times about was a specific threat against individuals? Uh, was that was that something we had reported? No, of course we didn't. But we would have reported graffiti or any concerns, you know. But apart from anything else, just to make sure that the police are aware, but also to reassure staff that we were working with the police. So we would have done that anyway. But Robert, I don't know if there's anything you want to add or correct to make sure that I just want to make sure that I'm not I'm not missing something that uh, the committee needs to hear. So just briefly to run down the timeline, um, 28th of the, uh, of January. I was attending a solace meeting just to talk about the operation of the ports uh, and the, the role of our, our staff, uh, also discussing charging. And almost as an aside, I mentioned the, the graffiti and the security situation. I repeated the PSNI threat assessment that they felt that this was an organised threat uh, and of a low level and uh, was um, informed by the Chief Executive of Mid East Antrim that that wasn't the case, that she had local information that it was serious. So the next morning at our Gold Command meeting, I reported that um, uh, that information because I, I was quite surprised by it um, because we were going along on the understanding uh, with the staff and briefing the staff that this was a low-level threat and um, this that was what the PSNI were, were telling us. Um, and, and just also, John, if I can, to to repeat that the PSNI, uh, working with my staff on risk assessments, uh, specifically for the for the for each of the sites that we have, and in coming in and giving staff via Zoom and other otherwise uh, crime prevention and personal security advice have been great and have greatly supported um, the staff and made them feel much more secure in their work. So I'd like to publicly acknowledge that. Okay, so thank, thanks for that. But though, just, just to clarify then, uh, I, um, I'm clear that there, there was a uh, perception uh, conveyed to yourself by the council official, albeit a very senior council official, but it appears to me that nowhere between the 28th of January and the 1st of February did either the council, and we, we can ask them at a later stage, of course, or the department go to police and ask for an urgent reassessment because of the um, emerging information? Well, well, I think the only thing I would say about that is my my phone calls with uh, ACC McEwen were about making sure that there was urgent clarification because, you know, as I mentioned on the first, in fact, as I so there's a timeline shows you, on the 1st of February, the, the, the pressure was building around this because, you know, we were getting this information in. The minister had contacted me at the lunchtime. I had spoken to, in fact, to be fair, the minister had actually put, said, um, it's important you ring the police and you need to make sure that, that they're fully aware of all of the facts. And I said, that's right. Um, and uh, so I, I had, um, I was saying to, to um, ACC McEwen, look, you know, uh, really important. We have a good understanding of what's going on. And as I say, you know, he, he was consistent and he has been consistent. It was consistent with his subsequent um, statements. And you know, low level of threat is is one. I I understand that's that's how it's summarised, but it's a little bit more. It was a little bit more nuanced than that. As I say, just in terms of the, the different aspects of that. 
But so the, the fact that I was ringing, I, I, I wouldn't be, um, you'd probably be glad to know as a permanent secretary, I don't, I don't want to be in a position where I'm having to ring the police every day. It wouldn't be an everyday occurrence. So the fact that I was ringing him, the fact yeah. that I went to the actual assessment uh, or the, the meeting the following day and all of that, that's not normal. That's, that's, that, was, that reflects the fact that, um, you know, that, 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 this, that there was serious concern being expressed to us. And actually, honestly speaking, that was just, that was, that was uh, uh, the same for us as well. I was, I was just genuinely getting concerned. I'm thinking, are we missing something here? Is there something that's happening below the radar that we're just not, you know, we're not aware of? Hmm. Okay, thank, thank you both for that. Okay, thank you. Um, Patsy? Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks to Dennis and uh, Robert there for, for their for their their uh, information. I think we've covered quite a bit of that, um, but um, we did hear from ACC Singleton earlier that at no point had any complaint been registered for investigation in terms of a risk or a threat to any individual. Now, um, while that specifically doesn't concern me in regard to DERA, it does concern me that um, there's information provided to us, evidence provided to us at the committee um, by uh, the union representative, and that had not been followed up on either by way of the council reporting it to uh, the police or that individual being um, asked by police for further information around that. Um, that would concern me, and I'm sure the department um, were issues like that to have been raised directly with the department for investigation or clarification. I presume normal practice would be to pass on anything like that for investigation by police. Would that be correct, Dennis? Yes, if there's a, a, anything that we're concerned about that where a crime may have been committed or where there's an issue, you know, the advice to the staff is clear. You know, contact the police, we'll contact the police if, if something gets escalated through our goal command. That's, that would be normal practice. No, I appreciate that. Now, if we maybe move on, and you touched, thank, thanks very much indeed for raising it, because it's a very, very topical issue with an awful lot of people here in the north, and that's how we're progressing or other ways. And I know there are discussions taking place between British government and the EU around the protocol. Um, was that now, just, I, I was listening earlier, the um, the issue of the, uh, was that the full, full bill programme you were referring to? Yes, it was, yes. It has been delayed. Is this the same full bill program that back in November was anticipated that it could take till, and I think I'm reading your evidence here, could take till June 2021 to complete? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. And I, I have to say um, part of that is that's one of the reasons why I wanted to mention it today, because I want to make sure that the committee is fully informed as the picture changes. Um, and I suppose um, the, when we were, when we were, uh, was that, Sorry, when was that evidence uh, session that you referred to? Fifth of November. Fifth of November, yeah. So at that stage, yes, I mean, uh, we were working on the basis that um, the contingency arrangement, I mean, to be fair, I suppose the contingency arrangements have worked well. Um, they're not perfect, and there's things that, uh, that that we would need to, you know, the contingency facilities, I should say, have worked well. They are good quality facilities as contingency arrangements, but they're not, they're not, um, they're not suitable for long term. Um, and I suppose the the challenge at that stage was we were focusing all our attention on getting those contingency arrangements in place. And we hadn't really the opportunity, and, and for that matter, the contractors hadn't an opportunity at that stage to look at a proper full build program. Now, in the meantime, um, you know, we've now had three months of data coming in around the running of the ports, and we're getting a better idea as to what's involved. Um, and in fact, not, not a perfect idea, but we're getting a better idea. And that's giving us a sense of the scale of the challenge. And actually, the bit, the, the, the bit that's worrying me most at the minute is actually just um, the, the, the facilities will be an issue. There's no doubt about it. And we'll need to go to the executive for, for discussion. But um, the, the, the real worry is around, you know, the volume and the number of veterinary staff required and how that could be how that could be achieved. I mean, and, and this is taking all of the politics out of it, just in oh, yeah. terms of practical uh -huh. operations. But then that in turn then has an impact on on the uh, building requirements. 
Um, and that's why, and that's why, I mean, a normal program like this, you're talking about a major build, you know, of the order of 50 million pounds, including the contingency arrangements. Um, something like this takes time to actually get right. And really, I suppose, in a sense, we haven't had a chance to pause and say, what is it, ex what, how should we be taking this program forward with good governance? Because up until now, it's been all about meeting a deadline on the 1st of January and, and getting that up and running, which we did. But actually, you know, again, taking the politics out of it, we just needed to take that time and rebase it properly and understand what the issues are. We're not quite there yet. There's a bit of work we still need to do, particularly around staffing. So that's that's the reason why, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, we were certainly looking back on it in November. Um, that, uh, uh, that was at that stage still our uh, target, but that was on the basis of before we'd had the conversations internally and also with our contractors about what's what's going to be required for the full build. Um, now, knowing what we know now about the, the, the volume of um, material yeah. coming through. I have to confess that that's odd, Dennis, because before you would build anything, you'd normally have those conversations to establish what you are going to build. And now this, this seems to be slipping back almost two years. Um, I, I just don't quite understand or fathom that. And could you explain to me then why it's having to be referred to the executive too, please? What has what what moved in there to move it from the host department, which is yourselves, to have it to go to the executive? So anything that's uh, significant, cross-cutting or controversial needs to be brought back to the executive. Now, ultimately, it will be a decision for the minister to bring it to the executive. He already has taken that decision with an earlier paper, which hasn't been tabled yet. Um, and that was following on from the earlier uh, briefing we'd given you about uh, four Minister Lyons' decisions and nine Minister Boots' decisions on the back of that. Um, so we had, uh, so that that means that we are in that territory already. It is significant. It is cross-cutting, and it is uh, controversial. Pretty uh, well, I, 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 that would be my view, but maybe that's maybe maybe people would have a different view. The, in addition to that, there's the fact that um, you know when in, in a normal again in a normal case, um, there's been a lot of different examples of major infrastructure programs <clears throat> when there hasn't been necessarily the same level of controversy around you know the, the reason for them or why they're being built. But they've been big programs and they've been big executive uh, programs requiring executive endorsement. And it's been perfectly normal to go back to the executive on those sorts of projects. Yeah. Um, so this even taking that sort of criteria, we would need to go back anyway. Um, you know, so but but certainly given given the uh, the fact that there is um, you know that it, that these are significant cross cutting and controversial, that's the main rationale. Well, then the, the final bit on that, and then I want to come over to the staffing issues. Is uh, presume has there been a tender entered, entered into with contractor or contractors about this? Because if a contractor has been uh, issued with a tender and has complied with that tender for a new build or completion in June of this year, and that is slipped back till January, possibly 2023, and we all know about contracts and how those and extra costs and all those sorts of things can kick in. So so therefore, there's going to be a potential upwards of two-year slippage in this contract, and the start date and completion date, all those things. Um, I presume a contractor is not going to be hanging about for uh, a year and a half or, or a year, whatever it may be, for the department to get its act together, departments to get their act together around start date and completion date, because they have staff, they have resources, they have everything to manage that contract. So presumably that all has now changed and shifted. And uh, I find it rather odd how that's going to be managed and how that's going to be fulfilled without additional costs. Yeah, I think those are, I mean, I'm just very, want me to get into the detailed commercial sort of discussions. Yeah, uh -huh. and I don't think that would be, that would be necessarily appropriate, but I think the general principles of what you're saying, I wouldn't disagree with. Actually, um, you know, we have, we've worked in good faith with the contractors and continue to work in good faith with, faith with the contractors. Mark can talk in a bit more detail about that. Um, he's he's in regular contact through our colleagues in CPD. I guess um, adding delays to do result in costs, um, and yes, they all of those things are are part of the challenge. I think, in fairness, can I just maybe take us back to the fact that you know, if you take a look at what was delivered in Dublin, and you take a look at you know, which is the only comparator we have around something like this, 
it took an awful lot longer than seven months, or for that matter, it, it took longer than it took them to get the whole thing up and running three years. And then this is talking to my counterpart in the in the south. So when you think, you know, when you look at it in that light, what we're really doing is we're saying that we went, we we were going full on at it. Remember uh, last year we didn't have clarity from the EU and the, the UK. The negotiations were still going right up until the 31st of December. We're only sitting here in, uh, you know, in the middle of April now, having run an actual live service for three months. Honestly speaking, I mean, just I've said it before, the fact that our, our staff and Mark in particular uh, on the contract side got it to where we got it to was really a miracle. Um, but but I, on all of the points, that doesn't take away from the points you're making. You're absolutely right. Those are issues that we will need to manage our way through and address and work with the contractors on. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to mention it today was to make sure that we're open and transparent about that. And maybe, would it be helpful, Mark, just to say a few words about, about where we are with the contractors? Yeah, I can, I can pick that up. Dennis, can you hear me okay, uh, Chair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, committee members, uh, and, and particularly Patsy. Thanks for raising those those queries. This is a, a fairly extensive contract, uh, and it's what they call an NEC Level 3 contract, contracted services. So in very, very simple terms, you, you pay for what you get. Um, but in, in the real world of, of contracting, it's just not as simple as that. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, at the minute, we've issued a controlled stop uh, to the program design team on the contractor side which is really saying to the, the contractors, can you wait for six weeks uh, and take time out for six weeks to allow us to get through some of the key issues that we're trying to deliver at the minute? And Dennis has covered those. For example, we need to finalise the designs. We need to finalise our schedule of accommodation. And we need to really get into the, the workforce planning side. And they're, they're being conflicted by the fact that we have to consider what the digital assurance scheme will handle. And there are some costs associated with that, and I'm working my way through those at the minute, and I can certainly provide a, a fuller briefing to the, to the committee. But in terms of, of compensation payments, I'm working with CPD to look at those, um, and they could be in the region of, of £300,000. Um, but I'll take you back to the, to, to the initial need of this contract and how it's delivered. It's really you pay for what you get. But I'm very, very uh, you know, close uh, to all of the contractors through CPD, and we're very, very aware of the impacts that we'll have on the contractors um, because we're taking through uh, three really big contracts at Belfast, Lauren, and I suppose Warren Point with foil a, a, a bit smaller than that. So we're currently working our way through that. And we have actually yesterday uh, written off for, for legal advice on the details of those contracts to support us as we work our way through those. I hope that's, hope that's helpful. Um, just one final thing, Chair, if you'd bear with me. Um, there would be a, an understanding, and I am very aware that uh, EU officials do observe the proceedings of this committee. Um, there would be an understanding, if not an undertaking, that this work was to be done pretty pronto. Um, uh, is this issue now that has emerged today, that, that I'm aware of today, anyway, and the committee's aware of today, uh, that it won't be the projected uh, completion for this new full build programme? is January 2023, is that going to cause obfuscation and cause further problems there in a situation which is difficult enough to manage as it is anyway? Um, we, we've, uh, we work very closely with our tax colleagues and we, um, and, and obviously they're in uh, uh, communication with uh, EU through, through at an official level and likewise Robert would be in, uh, in contact with the EU officials. So we've made sure that people are aware of this. And honestly speaking, um, this kind of gets to the heart of where we've been throughout this whole process. We've had a political process around a trade agreement, um, and around which is uh, perfectly normal and natural. In the middle of that, we've been trying to implement some very significant operational changes. Uh, as we've talked about, these changes are controversial, but they're challenging even on an operational basis, and that's been right. And I suppose one of the fantastic things about this committee is that we have we we have uh, been very happy to come along, talk to the committee, uh, work with all, and tell you what's happening, uh, whether it's right or wrong on the ground. We want to make sure that we we that you know that, but also um, we're very happy to communicate more broadly because it's the only way that we've been able to get to this point is by being very straight. And if you remember. Uh, when at the first committee meeting when we talked about this and I took on the SRO role, I said, 
we're red amber and we're going red. Uh, and indeed, we got a, an independent gateway review and it confirmed we did go red. Um, and, uh, you know, that's really how we've we've worked this from the beginning. So I think your point is absolutely fair. Um, but unfortunately, we're we're at the end of it that has to deal with the operations after everybody else has had the big discussions and political political negotiations. And we just have to do our best within those constraints and deliver what we can when we can. And that's that's where we are. Well, to get that done, that it would have been very unrealistic, as I think maybe I pointed out at the time, or tried to point out at the time, that to deliver a full build programme in six months of, of this cost would have been nigh and impossible. Never, the planning approvals hadn't even been received at that stage. Just one final thing then, Robert, is for yourself. Uh, thanks for that, Dennis. Um, Robert, back on that occasion, you mentioned that you would need 25 vets, 75 portal inspectors, and 12 admin staff. Uh, to do the checks that, that you talked about. Um, what way are you coming along as regard to that? How, how far advanced is that? And um, uh, in terms of meeting those requirements, those staffing requirements, please. Staffing requirements are uh, are up to expectations, except for vets. And I have half the vets. I need around 27 frontline uh, vets is, I think, the number that we're working to at the moment. At the moment, I have about 12. Um, which doesn't give very much room for people to get leave or for people to have a proper work-life balance. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a real issue for me. Uh, the veterinary work is twofold. Um, it's, there's a paperwork part to it where the, all, all of these common health entry documents and certificates we talk about have to be signed off and most of them have to be signed off by a vet. Um, so there's that job, and then there's actual overseeing the physical inspections. Um, so there's two jobs. And at the moment, we're doing our best to try and keep the documents moving and do the paper ones, but we're not doing the level of physical checks that we'd need uh, because we just don't have the staff, and to some extent, we don't have the facilities. Um, and it's a pure volume that I don't think we or the Commission or anyone anticipated. The figures are astronomical as to what we're doing. We're doing about uh, 325 uh, documentary uh, ched checks by a vet per day. And that's a lot. That's a lot. And they, they, you, you mentioned the vets there, the portal inspectors and the admin staff, you said at that stage you'd need 75 portal inspectors and 12 admin staff. How, how are you squaring up and meeting those requirements? Uh, th th that's not a problem. Um, the groups, the, the, the portal inspectors, I don't have difficulties. And we also have other staff that we didn't re recognize that we needed. We have what we call stevedores, which are really people to help us unload vehicles and, 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 and do the physical work around the place. We had a group of industrials. Most of those grades, we have sufficient staff to do the, to do the work. Uh, the pinch park is around the inspectors in my side on the plant uh, on the uh, on the veterinary side but we also have a deficiency on plant inspectors so on the professional grades of staff that are responsible in law for signing off the the entry documents uh, that's where our pinch point is and it's a difficulty i think a, a, across the piece and are you likely to receive those shortly or what's what's the aim to look at a different way. Um, they aren't, as I said earlier on, Patsy, the, the, um, the indications are is that this, the, the vets just aren't out there in the workplace. Uh, whether you're in private practice or in government, there is a, there's a problem there, and we've talked about that before as well. Um, so I'm looking at a different way of doing it, um, and I'll be putting, hopefully, proposals to the minister tomorrow about that, so I don't really want to uh, preempt that. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, Dennis and Robert and Mark. There. Thank, you, thank you, Chair, for your forbearance. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, just, just before, as a wee follow on, Patsy, before we move on to the next speaker, see in terms of, um, you know, there, the, 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 there, there obviously must be fierce pressure on uh, the staff, Robert and Dennis. Uh, you know, the, you, Dennis, you quite rightly said, um, you, you know, obviously the the numbers and, and, and Robert says, we know you're always at a half, less than half of the vet you need, but, um, and there's that's implications for shifts and work patterns. Um, surely that, that might have a big impact on, on those staff, on the, on their morale and on their, on their, 
on, on their work life balance. And has that been taken into account? Has the department been um, taken into consideration the impact of all this on staff? Yes, mm-hmm. uh, it's a it's a huge concern, uh, Chair, and uh, a very difficult one to uh, to solve. And we have set up. It's structures within the department to look at it, uh, to look at novel ways in which um, we can we can help to mitigate this in some way. On the actual morale bit, it's a strange thing because there's a real fighting spirit out there, and uh, <laughs> they. I'm I'm almost having to we're having to try and force people to take to take leave. There's been one or two staff where literally they've been told you're taking a week off, uh, and they haven't wanted to go because they're aware of the. The space they're leaving behind when they step out of the line, um, and uh, I have to commend the staff for that. That they the work they're doing is tremendous, and their dedication is tremendous. Their professionalism is tremendous, but it, it's not sustainable. And uh, we, we've 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 come to the point where uh, we're really something has to be done about it. And I have a, a range of thoughts about what could be done about it, um, and we're, we're we're going to take that forward. But the, the staff have done a great job, and for the for the issue that. We're talking about today when they were given the option of of you know if you don't feel that you want to be at work you know go home nobody went home um they stayed at their, their workplace yeah yeah it's important we all, all we all remember that that these are human beings with families and all in the back of the back in the back of it all too so it's like that's an important issue going going forward to keep um an eye on that on their morale and, the, and their own welfare as well. Uh, uh, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and can I thank Dennis and Robert and Mark for their coming along today. Um, for me, the state of the staff requirement, I know the department are in, and the officials are in a difficult position. You, you, you make a decision to withdraw staff. Uh, you blame for doing that, and we hadn't done that, and, and the situation arose where someone was injured. He should probably have blamed them for not moving staff. But in, one member said earlier that it, by moving staff created chaos. Uh, am I right in saying that it had no major effect on trade? You know, lorries kept, were still moving and didn't really create any chaos. Am I right in saying that? Well, we can talk to you. That, that, that's correct, in that we were still doing documentary and identity checks. Uh, and all that happened really was that the percentage of physical checks that we were able to complete dipped. We still did animal checks, we still did plant checks, um, but the percentage of, of checks that we were doing on other products and supermarket goods uh, was less. But we allowed those consignments to to enter Northern Ireland. We weren't we weren't putting a block on it because we couldn't do the checks, and that's the that's the position. You. Then earlier, Robert, uh, can I maybe just touch one more? In relation to the, any threat, do you have any concern coming from line monitors in relation to threats? Or? I went out and uh, and spent a bit of time with the staff and to understand where they were at. And regardless of the grade, whether they were managers or whether they were frontline, there was a full range uh, of 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 concerns uh, across the staff. Some, um, perhaps of my own sort of age, who'd lived through former times, were very blase about it. I just went, what? Um, but I have a lot of staff who were younger, who hadn't experienced anything like this before. Um, and uh, staff from overseas, staff from other parts of Europe, um, whose families back home, uh, and wherever that might be, were concerned uh, about them. And what came across most was that staff were feeling okay and reassured at work, but that some were really concerned about um, their home life and about the effect this might have on their families. And perhaps people living in a, in, a, in a community where their work in the port might be appreciated. Uh, and they were much more concerned about being at home. That, that hadn't really hit me. I, I'd been thinking about work. I hadn't been thinking about their home life. Um, but. So there was a full range of, of, of attitudes of the staff and things they were bringing me. And you know, when when people are writing on walls that port staff are targets, you know, it it that's not something to make light of. That that is that's serious to the people that, that this is directly affecting. And uh, as I say, the, the range of of reactions was what you'd expect in any group. Some just shrugged their shoulders and, and went about their business, but others were genuinely concerned. 
In relation to vets, uh, Robert, you said earlier that you should put out an ad for vets and you're only able to get five more vets. We're currently in the grace period at the moment for there's much less checks and there's potential to be after that ends. Where are many vets after the grace period ends, will you then need to, if, if there's no changes, I, I believe there'll have to be significant changes to the protocol for, for staff and for the department to be able to have any chance of dealing with it. But, but given, given where we are today, if there was no changes to the protocol, how many vets would you need at that stage? Um, led by the secretary, we've been doing a bit of crystal ball gazing on this, uh, and we can't get away from a, a range. So at the, at the moment, we're doing, um, you know, two and a half thousand checks of of, of, uh, of uh, two thousand four hundred or so of a, a Ched P type, and the estimates have been given before are somewhere between twelve and a half and twenty five thousand. We really can't um, do very much more uh, about accuracy than that. And that's working from work from assumptions we've made on on consignments that come through Northern Ireland to go to the south with some of the supermarkets. And where there is one Stanley, one self written declaration per consignment at the moment per freight unit or a lorry going to one of the supermarkets, it's likely that each one of those loads will have six to ten export health certificates, a veterinary certificate, six to ten plant certificates and perhaps more than 50 fish catch certificates on one freight unit that is currently covered by one self-written declaration. Uh, so you know, that's where I'm getting this, the, 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 the huge range from, 12,500 to 25,000 of documentary checks of cheds that, uh, that, that need to be done. And if you look at, you know, I was saying that we're doing 325 a day at the moment. Well, that, those numbers are astronomical. So we're talking about, you know, three times as many vets as we don't have at the moment uh, or something along those lines, uh, you know, probably something around the 60 mark. Um, but uh, and that's that's getting close to unachievable. So in other words, if there's not changes, significant changes to the protocol, it's almost undoable. But I'm right in saying that. Kiss, risk case scenario is undoable. Um, I'm, I'm quite content to say that. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. And um, thank you, John. Good to see you again. I suppose we'll start out with saying, like, I mean, early intervention, attack life and stuff is the best way, and it didn't have any serious implications. And I'd like to think it'll be done again without question if the need arose. Like we all know when danger arises, we need to act fast. And um, like um, some of us think maybe that was overreaction, I don't think it was. If you're one of the staff, you certainly wouldn't think so. It would increase your confidence to know that you are being looked after. Um, I suppose a question I would like to ask you is, is how long did it take the PSNI to send a written risk assessment? Like was it hours or days or whatever? Thank you. The, 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 um, we've had uh, discussions, I, I, I should say, sorry, it's probably, it's probably important to say that, um, and Robert probably knows more about the practicalities of this, but sometimes flat assessments take, take a little bit of time to actually get together because it's not just, uh, there's a wide range of sources. I don't know, I don't pretend to know and I don't want to know the, the details around that, but I know that they do, they do, uh, it does, be, there's, there's quite a formal process. But I suppose really the issues we're talking about were kind of coming to a head on the 1st of February. And it was very clear we would you know, we'd need something written by then. Um, and we had had the report, we had had good discussions with PSNI. We could be getting a lot of verbal feedback, but um, it was the, the formal written threat assessment was received on the 4th of February. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was, it took three days to get, to get that from the first. Yeah, like if, if it took a number of days to respond, surely that shows it wasn't a straightforward assessment then, really? Well, I, again, I don't pretend to understand how these things work, but I know I know they're not they're not a straightforward thing. And and, and in fairness, I, I mean, I'd, I'd much rather have good quality threat assessment to know where we are, you know, than... than, than but yes, it does it take some time. I don't know, Robert, do you want to add anything to that? You probably know a bit more about this than I do. A little bit more, but it's just a matter of um, having together 
intelligence and information uh, from a number of different sources. Um, and the PSNI will use both open open sources that like the social media and like the media, um, uh, but they will also have their own sources and those of other uh, organizations that they'll have to draw on. And obviously it takes time for all that information to gather together, to be weighed, and then a, a assessment to come out the end. So it, it's it's not just somebody sitting in a room and scratching their head and saying, "Ah, oh, that's a bit of that." No, it, there's a there's a formal process through behind the threat assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, appreciate that. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Harry. Chair. Thank you, Chair, <clears throat> and good to see you again, um, Robert and Dennis. Thank you. Uh, can I go back to this letter that was written by Mid and East Antrim to it was sent to was it the Home Office? Uh, it was a cabinet office. We were clubbing into it. Sorry. Um, do you know what date that letter was sent? Uh, I think we were clubbing into it. I think I referred to it on the first. Um, I think it was. The, I think it was. The, see, I'm just one wee second just to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was the first. First of February. And it wasn't just. It wasn't. Uh, it, should, it was a range of issues concerns around the protocol. Including the um, the crafting direct craft as well. So I find it very hard to hear you. Then I suppose. Oh, sorry, apologies. Apologies. Oh, I I was, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yes. Sorry. Apologies. It was. It was on a range of issues. It was the cabinet office it was on a range of concerns around Northern Ireland protocol and the operation of it. It included staff concerns of staff safety, but it was wider than that. Okay, and you had cited that before it was sent or after it was sent? No, 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 they copied, they, they, which was a, cur a courtesy of the council, the copy sent that. Okay, and have committee got sight of that or are we allowed to see that letter? Um, I would have thought it'd probably be better to ask uh, Mid East Antrim for that, you know, given that it was a letter. They can... Okay, thank you very much. Um, just what then go back, I mean, I completely understand what you're saying about the difference between. Um, a threat assessment and a health and safety for staff assessment, then they are very, very different things. But we know that throughout all this, that the the threat assessment never um, escalated above low level in terms of PSNI assessment and remained there. But the health and safety, I mean, we can just look at, you know, the escalation since the 1st of February, really at the end of January, when all this was, you know, in public and in media, um, and how that has escalated, it wouldn't be too hard to sort of link that really to the escalation to the riots that we were seeing on the streets um, over the past few weeks. But that's for somebody else to do. Do you know what? I'm using that as an example of how quickly things can escalate. So if we go back to looking at the the health and safety assessments for staff. Um, and you're obviously making those in terms of looking after their welfare, their conditions, um, as well as a, a, a security or a perceived security risk. Can I ask then, see with the fact that there's still no recruitment happening, and we're hearing from Robert there how much pressure staff are under, and that when we end the grace period, how much more staff are going to be needed, and that that recruitment process is going to take even longer. Um, so the, the minister hasn't opened that recruitment. Have you carried out a, a health and safety assessment on current staff working under these conditions? And what's that assessment then? Okay, so look, thank, thank you for that. I'll, I'll let Rob talk uh, about how we can continually address uh, health and safety. There's a very, can you hear me okay? Just checking you can hear me, no? As you're coming and going, Dennis. You're okay, well, to okay. Out, Dennis, just in the last few seconds there. Just okay, there. I'll stay exactly where I am. Unfortunately, you're going to have to see me closer to the screen. But anyway, uh, the, um, the Robert can come in and talk about the continual health and safety assessment that is taken forward. Um, we uh, This is something that we discuss very regularly. We discussed it as recently as Monday. And uh, in, in the same way as we were talking about health and safety issues more generally, um, this is part of that. And we will not be putting our staff at risk in terms of, uh, you know, overloading them with work uh, in a way that leads to health and safety risks. That's not that, that we uh, it is it is not our intention to continue with that. And I've made a very clear steer to, to my team that uh, I expect us to to work, do everything we can to comply 
but we will do it in a way that is safe for staff. And if we can't do that, that's going to be a problem. I, I just the only other thing I would say is I would, I, I know I'm not sure, I don't think you're making this point, but just in case anybody else makes the point, I think there are wider issues going on in society at the moment. A lot of issues and they're coming together in different ways. And our specific decisions about doing physical checks or not, I would, I would argue that 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 does not that has not um, contributed to any wider um, issues. Uh, frankly, and if it has, I'm afraid that's part of we we have to take health and safety decisions, and that's all we can do. We can't we can't look at the wider politics in that sense. But Robert, do you want to say something about staff health and safety in terms of workload? No, it, it's an ongoing process. Um, my group's health and safety officer is in the ports on a regular basis, talking to staff as well as looking at the facilities. And the fact that, as I said earlier, we have pulled staff off and told them to go home for a while um, shows you know, where managers' um, centre of gravity is on these things. Now, a, first, a first rule of any employer, particularly in the civil service, is that your work shouldn't make you sick. And... Uh, We'll, we'll try not to make our people sick if we can possibly manage it. But that's not to underestimate, Claire, the, the point you've made uh, uh, about the staff. And I thank you for that and for the and, and reassure you that um, we're, we're doing the best we can to keep our people well. And can I ask then on that one, um, how much contact or um, meetings have you had with trade unions on this issue? Regularly. Um, Brian? Do her, my deputy leads on that for me, and uh, meetings with trade union side uh, are regular. There, there are a number of um, uh, of issues at the moment uh, with the staff's terms and conditions uh, that are being worked through with unions. So the the trade union side are are regularly with us discussing many aspects of the portal delivery. Um, we work closely with, with with the portal and have done. Um, right through the development, the uh, the sites and uh, and and the the processes and protocols we use. Great, and listen, we're going back to then the the first of February when the minister was so concerned about the threat and the risk to staff that he removed them from their jobs. So, in terms of the current conditions that existing staff are working under, in terms of being under resourced and overworked, can I ask you what the minister's assessment of the impact of their risk and safety has been? Or is? Um, the, the Minister of Health and Safety Assessment is Dennis, you're up there again, Dennis. Hi, can, can you hear me now? Yes. The health, the health and Safety Assessment is for us as officials. Um, and, you know, it, it really is for us to make sure that we adjust the workloads accordingly. Now, the challenge there is we need to adjust the workloads, particularly at the end of press periods. Um, if we need to adjust the workloads and we don't have the staff in place, then that, that does bring us into a problem in terms of compliance at that stage. Um, but uh, at the moment, um, we're, we're working on the basis that we will do the work uh, necessary as far as possible to achieve compliance, um, but we will not put uh, staff health and safety at risk. That's not our intention. So, Robert, I don't know if you want to add to that. No, that's, that's a fair um summary of the situation we find ourselves in yeah okay so i can some so the, the can i am i right in assuming then that the minister is well aware that staff are continuing to be overworked under resourced not um facilitated um in terms of resources his his decisions should be um making their conditions better he's all aware of this um he is aware that come the end of the um the grace period that this recruitment is not going to be done and that you know staff are going to be even more pressured and um, yet he's refusing to take any action to mitigate against people's conditions right now well the only thing the only thing that we can comment on and that is really to say that uh, the minister is aware of the um the presence of um, okay, and, and yet I, I, I would not say too much, but uh, it's not, not here to just the minister's position, but his, his position would be that it means there needs to be an adjustment to the protocol. Okay. Um, that's, that would be his position. Uh, so we can uh, change the protocol, but we can't make conditions for staff any easier. But yet back on the 1st of February, when there was an assessment of a low-level threat. He was so concerned to their health and safety that he removed them from work. 
I think I probably go as near to the, the political analysis as, as I can, really, as an official, um, but hopefully, but I, he is aware of the conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, gentlemen, for your, your, your answers this morning. Uh, but you know, I, I think it's important that we have to understand that we are questioning officials today with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, in my experience, any threat, verified or otherwise, uh, was treated as a viable threat, and the protection uh, of life had been a top priority until that threat had been validated or checked later. You know, if I had been in the same position as the officials, my thoughts would have been to the, the health and safety of my staff, and that would have been par paramount. I would have done nothing different from what the officials have done, and I make that clear because as someone who was involved in a no-warning bomb in Ruby Road in Korean, I, I would have been grateful to have had a warning that could have saved lives that day, as it was. A message to the print room prevented me from being at the spot where the bomb detonated. So... Uh, I, 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 I speak from experience that I think the officials made the correct call that safety is paramount. However, it's been well documented and well answered, so I'll move on. Uh, I, I have concerns, as has already been alluded to, uh, uh, about the lack of vets available at ports and the difficulty in recruiting vets to provide assistance at our ports. In particular, what are the main threats to the NIGB trade through any delays in being able to carry out veterinary checks at our ports? Robert. Yeah. Robert. yeah, they this they as you know we're under um, constant supervision from um, EU co colleagues, veterinary colleagues. So it's well known um, as to what we are achieving and what we're failing to achieve uh, as far as the numbers of checks we are we're, we're carrying out uh, and, and the quality of those checks. Um, uh, and, and that's reported and discussed on a weekly basis with the Commission. So at the moment, um, we reached a peak where we were able to do 38% um, of the physical checks that we should have been doing. Um, but there have been times when we've down, been down as low as the mid-20s uh, of the checks we, we, we should be doing. And so far, we're ensuring that we're doing the checks that achieve, achieve the objectives of the checks in the first place, which is to protect the internal market, the single market um, of the of the EU from from real or perceived threats from GB product. So that's what we're doing, and we're making decisions on the front line as to what we prioritise and what that thirty percent of checks that we're doing um, contains, and ensuring that we're 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 doing the important ones. And that's why we do all live animals. And we do all of some categories of plants because on a, threat, on a threat risk assessment of the risk to the internal market for plant health, animal health, or public health, those are the places that we think we should, we should concentrate. So if you increase the number of checks we have to do, and, uh, and therefore without an increase in the number of staff or an improvement in the facilities, those that we, we can't do, increase the number we can't do, we continue to do that risk assessment. So the whole basis of of the checks that we do is to protect the single market uh, and, and that's that's what we'll try and achieve for the checks we carry out um, but there may come a stage where the commission decide that you're not doing enough or your efforts aren't as and and then the commission will have to take whatever action that they feel appropriate but at the moment uh, there's recognition i feel that we're doing our best that we're working on a different difficult circumstances, and uh, the commission have given me no indication that they that they are are close to that sort of a a resolution of the the issue. Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, as picked up on something that Claire had said, I was concerned about the health of, of staff working at our ports, and not just now, but whenever these checks, as you have alluded to, could rise to as as many as ten thousand per week. But you've answered that to to Claire, and thank you very much for that. Uh, but so we can get a better understanding of the amount of checks between the NI and GB, uh, what what are they compared to GB EU or EU any other third country, or or are the EU being particularly obstructive with the GB as a third country 
uh, more so perhaps than any other third country trading with the EU. Mm. Uh, Robert, do you want to well, having spent all day yesterday, I wouldn't like to take your take your your efforts. But look, a very simple indicator is one that I heard from my frontline staff yesterday, which is that, as I said, we're doing three hundred and twenty-five documentary checks uh, uh, a day, mm -hmm. and and Rotterdam, I believe, does one hundred and twenty-five. So that gives you a sort of uh, an idea, and the the number of the number of Chad P's we're doing at the moment. Uh, represents about 20% of all the JPs done anywhere in the EU, and um, we are the we're, we're the biggest. So we do more than France, who's second, or Germany, or Spain, or any other country. So Northern Ireland, with its 1.8 million people, is doing more import checks um, for products of animal origin than France. And that sort of puts it into perspective for me. Now, you can argue about details around the figures. The figures are not 100% accurate, but um, they're fairly indicative of the challenge that we're trying to, to reach. And, and frankly, why I'm only managing to do 30% of the physical checks that I should be doing according to the regulation. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, I don't underestimate the staff at all, and, and I appreciate everything you do doing there. And, and listen, you deserve full credit for, for your hard work and being able to do what you do do. One last question, Chair, with your patience, if possible. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah you, you, you stated that the infrastructure to facilitate port checks would possibly not be in place until 2023. How do you plan for such facilities while negotiations are ongoing between the EU and the UK? Uh, and is there any emerging clarity on the final outcome or are negotiations too fluid to be able to plan properly? It, it doesn't place the department in a very good position, I think, to actually plan for facilities at ports. Do you have your thoughts? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the, uh, there are um, issues that still need to be bottomed out. I mean, we've, we've you know, as I said before, we've now got three and a half months, we've got three months of data. Um, projecting forward in terms of it's almost impossible to project forward in a very accurate way um, as to how those will increase at the end of the grace period and one of the reasons for that I suppose is just knowing how uh, businesses will react um, the with one of the reasons I suppose we're doing so many cheds at the minute is because th this th this is a uniquely integrated economic system you know that's very different from uh, you know, traffic across borders between uh, EU countries, and that's and that's, I suppose, what the big unknown is. This is quite different from anything else that anybody's trying to do. So we need. There's a lot of work to be done around that, and uh, and part of that is definitely going to be influenced by the discussions happening at a political level. Uh, there's various uh, legal developments underway, and uh, and that's that's another issue. Um, so these things just add uncertainty and make it more difficult then to plan what is a major infrastructure program, um, because because it all comes back to the demand, the ability to deal with the demand through various measures such as the digital assurance scheme. And I have to say, I'll commend Defra again. Defra are doing fantastic work on that with our with our colleagues and uh, and they're leading that and they have involved us in that as far as as far as we can be involved. Um, but even with all of that, that doesn't necessarily reduce the numbers of CHEDs that have to be approved. And that's where the big challenge is, because that then in, in turn leads to uh, estimation or, or estimates about the number of physical checks. And that in turn leads to the estimates about the size of the infrastructure required and the scale and the nature of the infrastructure required. And I'm happy for, if you don't mind, Robert and Mark, just to come in and correct anything I've said there or add to it as necessary. Just to say, and then there's COVID. Um, are we planning facilities that are COVID ready for the next five years? Or uh, do we need big offices or small offices or no offices at all? Um, there are so many fluid uh, parts in all, all this that it, it is really difficult, which is why it is wise, as Dennis said in his summary, to stop and rebase this thing and try and work out, uh, now that we have data and a little bit more knowledge, are we actually building the right thing? 
Okay. Um, folks, um, thanks, Matt. Um, before I move on to Rosemary, I'm going to have to uh, step out here. If I was going to go over, um, have a meeting here now uh, with the NA Affairs Committee. So um, I'm going to just pull out here and really start getting me notes and stuff pulled together for it. So thanks very much, and Philip will, will uh, take it from here. Okay, I think Rosemary's next in the list. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you very much for your presentation so far and your comments so far. I want to go back to the shortage of staff. And again, like a number of others previously, I would be concerned about the health of the staff and their welfare, particularly in relation to the amount of work that they uh, will be expected to undertake if the um, derogations, etc., become uh, are withdrawn and their workload increases. And it's really this increase from this this increase from the the number of uh, checks up to the ten thousand mark that you that you spoke of. If that's the case. How, how long? Are, how long are? How long are goods? Will goods be expected to wait at the ports? How long will uh, cattle importing of livestock be expected to wait at the ports, etc., to get through the amount of checks that will be necessary? Maybe. Yeah, that's that, that's for me. Um, thank you. The the number of the, the increase in the number of checks will be on retail goods. Um, which to me are are, are low risk. Uh, and I've been working from the beginning of this on two principles or three principles, the welfare staff being one, two being to keep to keep product moving, both for for supermarkets and for retail and, and for and for raw materials for manufacturing, and then to keep the law. Those are the three things I've been trying to do. So on the on the animals coming through, there'll be no increase in the animals, and we always prioritise uh, the animals and their weight to make sure that animal welfare is looked after. That's one of my primary roles as chief veterinary officer is to make sure that animal welfare isn't compromised. So the the we will continue to follow those principles of trying to keep freight moving while at the same time trying to keep the law. But the the the, the potential hold up is around the supermarket goods rather than around animals or, or plants. And it's a complexity of the of the consignment that was in a freight load for a supermarket that that you know made the uh, the introduction of a grace period necessary to give supermarkets time time to think about this and also time for us to think about of both electronic and other process solutions to try and streamline it. Uh, and, and to apply a risk assessment as to what needs to be done uh, with greatest priority. So the, it's a, a meandering answer, Rosemary. Apologies for that, but I think I've got most of it in there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, right. You, so that's the vet, that's the veterinary end. You can only recruit what you can recruit. What's the situation with plant inspectors? You said there was a shortage of them. Have you any plans to try and uh, increase those numbers? Or where are they going to come from? The, the plant inspection, the plant inspectors are under a different line management, not under mine. But I do, I do know the difficulties because they are similar to those that I have myself. Um, there were some temporary plant inspectors in place uh, who have now left, and in order to backfill um, the, the the management in that particular unit, need to move staff from from their normal duties within field service into the port. And that's proving uh, quite difficult to do, though it's a process I think that's ongoing at the moment. So it's it's just highlighting again that it's not just vets, that there are specialist posts across a number of, of places uh, where, 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 where staff are needed. And I think um, that the local authorities will have similar problems with EHO numbers. Again, there there is a finite supply of environmental health officers that carry out their checks on high risk products not of animal origin, and I know from speaking to them that they have similar concerns about uh, where the additional staff will, will come from. 
Yeah, and in relation to plant inspectors, I, I understand. I know it's not your it's it's not your remit, Robert. But but I understand there's that problem also in GB in relation to when plants are being sent over to Northern Ireland, where they have to be checked, go to their various nurseries and and have the soil etc. checked. That there is a major problem also in getting plants over here. And that again is similar across all the certification areas, uh, in that there's there's a, a a huge number of 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 st professionals required to produce certificates, and then on my side, I need a huge number to well a large number to uh, to check them. So it's all part of the same problem uh, you've quite rightly identified. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank thank you very much. I don't have anybody else uh, looking in to ask a, any questions. So, uh, unless Dennis or Robert want to maybe make any concluding remarks, uh, no. So, I mean, I just want to thank you for, for coming. Uh, I mean, I, I note that you were here to talk about the inquiry that the, the committee is doing, but a number of members used the opportunity to ask lots of other questions. So uh, we, st we stayed within time schedule. So again, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the officials for attending and uh, you're free to go now. Can I seek the end from the members agreement to publish the department's briefing paper on the committee's webpage? Yep, everybody's happy with that. Okay. Thank you. So we're just going to move on then to item seven on the agenda, which is a departmental written briefing on SR uh, on the Agricultural Commodities Income Support Scheme 2021. Can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 23 in your papers uh, and from the, the department at page 25? Can I advise members that the committee last considered the SR at the SL1 stage on the 25th of February, uh, at which stage members indicated they were content with the merits of the policy and agreed that it should move to the next legislative stage. Members will recall that the purpose of the SR is to provide financial assistance to pig producers, broiler pullet and broiler hatching egg producers and organic milk producers who have suffered a financial loss due to COVID. The examiner, sorry, the examiner of statutory rules has advised that the SR is in breach of the 21-day rule. However, she is content with the explanation provided by the department. Are there any questions from any of the members? No. Okay. Uh, that being the case, uh, if content, I'm going to put the question that, that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2021-63 the Agricultural Commodities uh, Coronavirus Income Support Scheme NA 2021 and has no objection to the rule. Content? Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, Ever Hucht, uh, number eight. Departmental written briefing animal health law implications for the NA bovine tuberculosis program. Can I refer members to the written briefing from the department at page 39? <coughs> and advise members that the animal health law is listed in Annex 2 of the protocol and will apply here from the 21st of April 2021. And there are a number of key implications implica implications, sorry, for our TB program, and these include pre-movement or post-movement testing, uh, restocking, cleansing and disinfection, and other changes, herd statuses, and uh, interferon gamma. Uh, testing. So the EU Commission indicated in February that it will take a flexible and pragmatic approach to implementing the provisions uh, and its member states and it is invis not envisaged that these delays will result in an adverse impact on trade. An Im implementation timetable that takes account of the time required to ensure APHIS can help uh, administer the new requirements has been developed. It is likely to be several months before the bovine TB eradication program uh, can comply fully with the changes resulting from the AHL. Can I seek uh, any comments that members may have? No comments. Are members content then, uh, therefore, that we write to the department to request that it keeps the committee updated on the progress of the implementation timetable? Happy with that? Okay, that's agreed. 
Uh, number nine then, uh, which is a departmental written briefing on COVID-19 update. Uh, so can I refer members to the latest COVID-19 update from the department at page 43? Members are asked to put forward any questions on the update to the clerk by close of play uh, today. Are members content to move the COVID-19 update to a bi-monthly uh, written briefing? I think we discussed this uh, at our last meeting. People were, were generally happy with that. Okay, content. So moving on then to uh, number 10, correspondence. Can I refer members to the correspondence received at page 64? Uh, are members content to action the correspondence as suggested on the index sheet at page 54? There's a raft of correspondence. I hope you've all read every every word that wasn't contained in it. Okay, so everybody's content. Now, uh, have our hand jig, number 11, forward work program. Can I refer members to the draft forward work program at page 786? Sorry, and, Chair, Chair, my apologies. Can I come in? I had remained on mute there. <laughs> I was talking to myself for a minute or two. Um, can I come in, if you don't mind, on the correspondence issue? Um, there's a uh, letter listed, I have it down as page 669, regarding the import of bees. I think Claire raised this before. I know that I've been doing some work on it recently as well with colleagues. Um, could I request that we uh, forward that to the uh, department for comment and seek an update on the position? I have had sight of correspondence to a colleague of mine elsewhere which gives uh, a more updated position than that which I had in March, for example. And it might just be worthwhile to, to seek a view from the department on what's being done there, if that's possible. I think that makes yeah. perfect sense, John. Yeah. Happy enough for that, everybody? Yeah, okay. that's, uh, that'll be important. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you for that interjection, John. Okay, so moving on then just to uh, the forward work program at 11. So uh, it's at page 786. Uh, members will be aware that the horse racing amendment bill was introduced to the assembly uh, this week on the 13th. The committee will receive a briefing from the department on the bill uh, at the meeting next week on the 22nd of April. Uh, meeting of the Office of Environmental Protection members will find a memo from the clerk and briefing papers from DERA and RAIS for the informal meeting which we're having today at 2.30 uh, on Microsoft Teams. That's at page 802. Can uh, I ask members to note that the Office of Environmental Protection chairperson has requested that she is referred to as Dame Glennis. That would be important that everybody remembers that. Uh, can I seek agreement for the forward work program? Can I can I just say, Chair, I'll not be able to go to that meeting. I have PAC straight after this, so apologies. Okay. okay it may actually be a wee bit late on to it as well. I have an APG uh, after this meeting. But My apologies to you, Chair. Um, I have a commitment at that time. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, so, members. Can I just say as well, I know that the ad hoc committee has been recalled for three o'clock today as well. So, I'm trying to balance both of these. I might have to jump out of the meeting later too. Sandwich and Graham, you were all very busy today. Uh, members, uh, we're now going to move on to closed session to hear from the bill clerk on the role of the committee and the scrutiny of bills. So, uh, as members will be aware, the committee is likely to shortly have two bills to work on. So, can I just ask communications to ensure that all witnesses that had previously joined the meeting by Starleaf have now left the meeting? And also ask communications to add all members and Barbara, uh, the bill clerk, into the spotlight um, to note that we will be closed for around 20 to 30 minutes.